This is your home for St. Cloud State Hockey, keeping you up to date on the NCHC. One-timer coming, they score! Ripped in! A bomb from Perfect! Women's WCHA. So Dana Rasmussen fires and she scores! Dana Rasmussen for the Huskies. The National Hockey League. Dwayne Kaprizov in for a chance to win it! He scores! And everything from the state of hockey. St. Cloud Cathedral is now 42.6 seconds away from wrapping up the school's first ever title. Welcome to the Huskies Warming House Podcast Den. Welcome into episode number 130 here on the Huskies Warming House podcast early on this Sunday, September 25th of 2022. My name is Noah Grant and joining me is Nick Maxson at the Puck Scribe on Twitter. And we are excited to get rocking and rolling really our last preview of source before we really get into some hockey action. The women's hockey team back in action today already Um, thought they were back in action yesterday. Their schedule said so, but uh, we couldn't find anything. We're going to get into that. Um, They do have some announcements related to their team as far as some captaincy things going on. You won't want to miss that in the main portion of the show. A little discussion about some new jerseys coming out in the NCHC for a particular team that I think look pretty darn good. And then the Minnesota Wild, what do we expect from them heading into this season? They also play today with their first preseason opener against the Colorado Avalanche at 3 p.m. Central time. So we'll be discussing all of that, our extra ice session will be none other than the St. Cloud State men's hockey team. Again, if you missed it from last week, we did have almost two hours of content related to the St. Cloud State Huskies uh, in last week's show, so you won't want to miss that. We'll, we're going to kind of deep dive a little bit more into what we think the lineup card is going to be as we enter game week here for the men's hockey team, uh, getting ready for their exhibition matchup as well. And as always, Center Ice View News and Notes and the Huskies Illustrated Weekly Roundup. Center Ice View News and Notes. Center Ice View provides you with the best coverage of St. Cloud State Huskies hockey from game notes, recaps, photos, and more. Go to centericeview.com. Nice few news and notes, Huskies Illustrated Weekly Roundup, Noah. And uh, we have to talk about some signings in the National Hockey League. Uh, in particular, uh, Connor McDavid is no longer the highest paid player in the National Hockey League. It now yep. belongs uh, to Nathan McKinnon. Yes, I was waiting for uh, just dramatic pause there. Anyway, so uh, is <laughs> uh, able to I, find... I, I figured you forgot what you were going to have to eat at the old folks' home today. But that's, I mean, I digress. I I don't even know where the heck I am anymore, so it doesn't matter. Um, but he signed a NHL max eight-year extension. Uh, $12.6 million is the average annual value. Now, mind you, the total package, Noah, a lot of the money is in signing bonuses. So he gets a lot of his money up front every single year. His base salary um, is a little bit, shall we say, less of the uh, the total package. But yep. um, the the probably the game's most electric player, at least the last couple of years, and certainly, no, without a doubt, the most underpaid player uh, finally getting probably what his money's worth is. Yeah, certainly. And you kind of wonder how different it would look if we didn't have the flat cap. Would he make even more? I believe mm-hmm. the league max is like 15.5 or 16 million is what you can give a player. It's And it's 20% of whatever your cap hit is. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, and the anticipation was by this point, we were going to be at about $90 million as far as the cap is. And we're at like 82 five or something like that. So, mm-hmm. um, but definitely well worth the money. I think it's a good price point. You wonder a little bit if the extra hundred K a year was just enough to slight Connor McDavid ever so slightly. Um, but yeah, you know, it's interesting that you've got, uh, a player that has been on a hometown discount, basically exactly half of that salary, $6.3 million for mm-hmm. the number of years, finally brings them a cup in Colorado. So no surprise that he gets that money. Um, I think it looks maybe a little different if Nazem Kadri stays. I don't think he gets that much. And I think he's maybe willing to take about maybe nine to $10 million or something like that. But uh, they had a little bit of extra cash and I think it'll be well spent with McKinnon, which the only thing is that, you know, eight years, I think he's, I'm trying to remember if he's 29 
or 30. I, I think he's somewhere around there, if I remember right. So he is going to be a bit older at the end of the deal. But with all these guys, right, uh, McDavid will be in the same boat, Crosby, all these guys that are impact star players. I mean, it's it, it's well worth the money. I mean, he just brought him a Stanley Cup. So, um, yeah, dare I say $12.6 million might even be a little bit low. <laughs> I think it is, honestly. And I think um, I don't think Nathan McKinnon, uh, the one thing I will disagree with you on, uh, McKinnon is I don't think he was taking less money. I think he took less money to build them a contender, knowing that he was going to ask for his deserved payday. Um, and well, either way, he certainly got it. So, uh, well, three ones. yeah, well, I was going to say the only thing is that there were a couple sources that had said that there was at least the discussion that if Nazem Kadri, if they were going to keep him, it was going to cost a significant amount. And McKinnon had at least had that discussion that if he was going to stay, he would be willing to maybe refinagle his contract a little bit as far as Kadri was concerned. Cause I mean, he's a huge piece down the middle that they lost. Um, yep. and, and part of the reason that they have, as we're going to talk about later, Alex Galchenyuk on a PTO as well too, who can also play center. Um, so, you know, like I said, I don't think it would have been a huge pay cut. I, I you know, I think it would have been, you know, $10 million instead of 12 or something, but um, certainly, the avalanche very strapped for cap as far as that's concerned. So um, I, from what it sounds like the discussion was at least had with him um, as far as like Nazem Kadri and the understanding of the situation where it might've been a structured contract where at least the first couple of years would have been a little bit less pay until that flat cap kind of alleviates itself around 2025. Um, but yeah, uh, dude's getting paid. So good for him. Mm -hmm. Speaking of guys getting paid, uh, the Oilers and also defenseman Ryan uh, McLeod getting a one-year extension, $798,000. Uh, still a young guy, uh, only 21 points in 71 games, uh, so they're hoping that maybe he re and continues to develop. Um, this is a more bigger one than New York Islanders, uh, a, bev a bevy of signings, shall we say. Uh, Nikita Shoshnikov, uh, goaltender Corey Schneider, apparently still playing hockey, and, and defenseman Parker Weatherspoon. Uh, all one-year contracts just uh, a couple of days ago uh, for Sasha Nakash, 2018-2019 uh, with the St. Louis Blues, I recall. Yes, uh, part of that, spent three years with the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, eight goals and 16 points in the 87 NHL games over the par parts of four NHL seasons. So uh, more of a depth piece than anything. And then Corey Schneider um, was starting for uh, the AHL affiliate of the New York Islanders as well. Uh, 30 games, 921 save percentage. Uh, can you believe he's 36 years old? That's unbelievable. Um, yeah. Just one, yeah, just one appearance with the big club last year. Uh, got the win against the New Jersey Devils, uh, his uh, former team, again, part of uh, a big trade to keep Roberto Luongo. And then a Witherspoon a restricted free agent, uh, who was a 2015 draft pick of the New York Islanders, uh, has yet to make his NHL debut. Uh, so some interesting signings there, I would say, there for uh, Lou Lamorello. Yeah, Corey Schneider can still play hockey. I think that's something that people forget. I mean, you got to realize only two goaltending positions total for every team as far as, you know, the starter and the backup at the big club. Um, he had that uh, absolutely abhorrent stretch when he was with New Jersey where he just could not buy a win. And I certainly think that kind of tainted his reputation a little bit, just, you know, where he was at age wise and then struggling a little bit. But I think it's a good little depth uh, piece too. Uh, you know, it's, you look at a player that, maybe can be serviceable and coming in. The thing that hurts him now is his age, but I mean, still a 921 save percentage in 30 games playing in probably the second, maybe third best professional league in the world. I mean, that's no slouch uh, as far as production. So um, definitely a serviceable backup, but he's well past his prime. Uh, he used mm -hmm. to be uh, really at the forefront of the National Hockey League in his younger years for quite some time. So good to see him still playing hockey. I think it'd, it'd be easy to kind of just, shut it down and not go back and play in the AHL after the number of years he had, you know, in the big time, but uh, still being productive and still getting that payday. So speaking of paydays, last payday we have to talk about is Sabres general manager, Kevin Adams getting a multi-year extension up there in Buffalo. Um, I think well-deserved. I think the, the Sabres are finally trending up with some of the moves that they've made, mm -hmm. especially uh, and I think really catalyst, um, with moving on from Jack Eichel, surprisingly, right? Um, they got some good mm -hmm. pieces in return um, from Vegas. I think Vegas would probably want to redo that one over if they could. Um, and it, not necessarily like not getting Eichel, but maybe some different pieces that they lost, maybe they want to keep. But uh, nonetheless, uh, keeping uh, GM Cam Adams uh, up there in Buffalo, 
And then uh, you mentioned PTOs, right? Uh, we talked about Alex Galchenyuk. Uh, how about this for Vancouver? Jake for Tannen, uh, trying to get back with his former club. Oh, with sorry, I, or, that's, a, that's a typo on me. Sorry, Edmonton, not Vancouver. I, I had Vancouver in my head because I saw Vertanen. It's Edmonton. That's my fault. Sorry. <laughs> well, came from came from Vancouver. So there you go, yeah. right? And then uh, how about this one? Sonny Milano. Uh, yeah, interesting that, that he wasn't. Yeah. yeah, it's not Anaheim either. I know. I was, I was having a day. Let's see where we're at here. So for those who are curious, by the way, I definitely wrote this last night at about midnight. So um, Sonny Milano is not going to Anaheim. So right. it was previously with Anaheim. Now, mind you, while, while we're uh, flames, uh, Calgary flames, I was yeah. going to say, I thought he was North. Um, but uh, a guy that I think has something to give still, I'm still younger ish. And uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like Anaheim moved on a little bit too soon from, from some, yeah. but I'm surprised that he doesn't have a contract like somewhere in the NHL right now, not even just a PTO. I think he's worth a look. In fact, I was kind of in the realm, especially with San Steele. I wouldn't have minded seeing him at Minnesota wild training camp too. And seeing if he could maybe make a little bit of noise too. I think he'd be a great addition. If anything in Iowa, uh, if you'd be willing mm-hmm. to take a two way deal, I think he, he definitely bolster that roster there. So he's a player of course, was part of maybe one of the most infamous plays in hockey in the last a decade, decade maybe yeah, probably with, with Trevor Zegris there so um yeah I think he gets a good shot Jason Demers obviously uh defenseman has kind of been plagued by injury the past couple of seasons Alice Galchenia kind of a journeyman as far as he's been concerned of course played for the Minnesota Wild and uh, really the challenge for him is name a team he hasn't played or tried out for um and then jake for tannin only with one club uh, in vancouver but obviously had those sexual assault allegations that were cleared earlier this year so that has kind of derailed a little bit of his career progression and i think he's even though he's been cleared i think it's hard for teams to to look at that and and move past that easily um Mm -hmm. but edmonton is going to give him a shot and i think that's that's a fair play i think it's about what you maybe expect uh in that situation it's kind of up to him to see if he can make camp he's been playing in the khl too so you know you have to see if it translates and he can still play hockey i mean he wasn't a he wasn't a driving force for vancouver right before he ended up leaving i mean the canucks weren't Mm -hmm. that good but he also wasn't you know a player that you look and say oh the canucks really missed him uh all things considered Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of players moving, right? Some trades. How about this one? Rangers trading Niels Lundqvist to the Dallas Stars uh, for a conditional first round pick in 2023 and a conditional fourth in 2025. Uh, he was the 28th overall pick in 2018. Um, he requested a trade out of the Rangers and uh, probably just, I don't know if there's any way for them to put him in the Rangers lineup. So he wants yeah. to play. Um, the stars 20 to 23 first round is top 10 protected, I believe. And if the Rangers will receive their 2024 20, first rounder, um, instead, um, if it is in the top 10, excuse me. Um, furthermore, Lundquist accumulated uh, 55 points over the next uh, two seasons. Uh, the fourth round pick becomes a third rounder. So, uh, some conditions in that trade, um, dare I say this is exactly the replacement from John Klingberg. Um, So, and then just a small note, right? Uh, Just tallied a goal in three assists in 25 games as a rookie um, last season, but 15 points in 34 contests with AHL's hard for Wolfpack. So the, the talent set is there. The skill sets there. The question is, you know, does he just need time in the NHL is to adjust and just get his game going? I would argue that probably is all he needs is this little consistency in the lineup. Yeah, right-sided defenseman, and with Adam Fox, Truba, all those guys, uh, pretty difficult for him to crack that lineup. And, yeah, just wants to play a little bit. Uh, Dallas, good little low-risk, high-reward signing. And I say low-risk, I mean, you have a first-round pick, but, um, you know, you kind of wonder where Dallas is going to be. I think they expect to maybe be at least middle of the pack in the NHL. So, they, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I think they maybe expect to be – as a pick around maybe where Minnesota was last year, you know, 2021, 20, something like that. Maybe I'm not sure. And I think they expect to make the playoffs, um, you know, or be at least a bubble team there. But uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting too, that, you know, a 28th overall pick uh, he doesn't really stand out to me as far as eye popping numbers, but again, he's a very moldable defenseman. And I think we've seen with the Dallas organization out of all the chaos that's come from them. One thing that has been successful, they've had a couple of defensemen that have really developed nicely. You mentioned Klingberg, Miro Heiskin and guys like that, that have been able to develop in the right way. So um, I think he's going to get some time probably down in Texas to start. Um, And by Texas, Mm -hmm. I mean the AHL affiliate, not the state. Uh, And then maybe Mm -hmm. he makes the move to Dallas in time. 
Would certainly agree. Um, So we'll keep an eye on that uh, situation there in the Lone Star State. Uh, Speaking of lonely, um, and maybe (laughs) this next, I mean, Jacob Chikrin, let's go with just more Arizona Coyotes news, right? Um, He did not deny. In fact, he sort of confirmed that he wants out of the Coyotes organization. In fact, he wants to be with a playoff contender. Um, He will not be ready for the start of training camp uh, just because he had uh, off-season ankle surgery. Um, He's only 24 years of age, and uh, this is what he said. This is the quote. It's kind of a mutual position for me to get moved onto a situation with a chance to win and a team that's fighting for a Stanley Cup, and for them here to be able to get assets. Um, And then he basically went on to say that I understand how rebuilds work, and I think it could be mutually beneficial. This is interesting, Noah, because, again, we – Arizona and with all the just very awkward flux that they're in right now. No, granted, there's there's uh, their their ticket sales for Mullet Arena have been widely popular. In fact, a lot of them already sold out. Um, but there's still the big question: they still don't have a permanent place to play um, up in the air. Again, uh, the city of Tempe still working through the negotiations. Um, there are some back channel conversations that have raised serious doubts, including potentially from the national hockey league players association um, with, if they were to do it, um, could they be sustainable at mullet arena for more than a de- essentially more than a year? Um, so Chikrin, he wants to play for contender wants out of the Arizona coyote situation. Um, my question to you, Noah, is this normally when you get a situation like this, um, players, if not organizations, don't really publicly acknowledge these kinds of things because I think it just looks kind of, you know, it just doesn't look the greatest. So what do you make of Chicker and actually coming out and essentially confirming that he wants out and also kind of putting, you know, what we all know is that Arizona's, well, not just in a rebuild, um, they're in just kind of survival mode. Yeah, um, I actually think it's good for both parties, like he said, um, and that might sound kind of weird, but here's why. Um, first of all, uh, it's been widely noted that Chikrin has been shopped around and for multiple NHL mm-hmm. teams at this point and just haven't gotten a deal done. Credit Arizona a little bit here. They've stayed patient with probably their best asset and movable mm-hmm. asset, um, and they want to get the right deal for their player. And until that, Chikrin has been very professional, very upfront about taking care of his body, playing the right way, doing what he has to do as far as that's concerned. So, um you know, I think both parties, including Arizona, dare I say, have been actually pretty professional about it. And I think it might end up benefiting them long term because I think you're going to get a team maybe at the trade deadline who maybe says, you know what, we need this extra piece and we also want them to stay long term. And they're maybe willing mm-hmm. to fork up that extra first round pick that you're looking for, that extra high end prospect that the Coyotes are just missing in that trade package. Um, I, I actually think that it's a situation um that has been a lot cleaner than for example, like Oliver Ekman Larson, where it was kind of Mm -hmm. this murky water type thing. I think it's actually going to help Arizona in the end. They're probably going to be hurting a little bit initially when the trade is made. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think they're still going to end up reaping the rewards of this one. Chikrin's a very good player. Granted, if he stays healthy, the scary thing for Chikrin is if he doesn't stay healthy, um, his, his trade stock starts to tank really crazy, although he might get moved a little bit easier. But um, yeah, beyond that, uh, I actually think that it's going to work out well for both of both parties involved. And you don't say that often when you hear a public trade request, because usually it it means the opposite. Mm -hmm. hundred percent. Yeah, so kind of interesting. I, I, I kind of curious. I mean, do you have like a different perspective on that? Because I, that, it, I, we're well, yeah, because I think we're one step away uh, from hearing a little bit more of what I believe are pent up emotions ba- based around the Arizona Coyotes. Um, we, yeah, but- but here's I mean, if, well, here's this. But if, if you're checker and how can you not be frustrated with everything that's going on? I think he just wants to play. For well, that's somebody what I else. mean. That's, that's what just, I mean. You know, you know, is that I think he echoes a lot of where a lot of, you know, because Arizona have essentially cleaned house. Let's just say yeah. that like a lot of the veteran guys are gone. So they are a very young team um, who a lot of them. This is their first taste of the National Hockey League um, or their second. And they just want a place to play. Um, but I do think Chikrin does speak for maybe some pent up emotions based around that organization where there's been some rumblings that uh, the NHL and the city of Houston were very, very close, like this close. Uh, but uh, the uh, I believe it's the Houston Rockets, that owner, 
um, actually flew in. And now essentially what it was is, hey, if you're going to move the team to Arizona, I'm going to you know, the only way you're playing in that building is if I buy the team from Alex Mariwello. And uh, from what we know, Mariwello does not want to sell the team. So uh, it's an it's an interesting dynamic right now down in Arizona. I think the sooner for whichever way it goes. And I say that we both know that whether the deal gets approved, meaning Tempe says, yes, build this thing. It's still four to five years away from actually opening its doors. Or dare we say the worst case scenario, or maybe what we all anticipate might happen, um, that it does not get approved. This is where I think, like you said, whether it's the organization itself or the players, I think they all just want this, like, un, like it's just this sort of gray area that they're in. They just want it to be done. They just want yeah. to be able to move the franchise forward in whichever way it has to, you know, but like, that's the thing is like, you know, I, I don't, I don't disagree that that's, you know, not a factor. I think it's, just, that's just like, it's so deep for an NHL player. Like I think for him, he's like, Oh, this situation's kind of weird. And you know what? The coyotes have not been good. I want to play for somebody who is good. I, I, I kind of feel like, cause like he's been professional about the whole thing. I don't think there's this big, like, you know, huge resentment type, thing where you know that's been no. this huge falling out between the player i think it's just just wants a change of scenery and wants to play his prime years on a team that has a chance to win a stanley cup i think that's kind of what it comes down to i don't i don't disagree that those parts play a factor i just i think if you're from an nhl player side of things like that's a huge like avenue that's a lot of information that really isn't relevant to jacob chikrin you know what i mean like it, it, collaterally it is but like on the surface like the dude's got to get healthy and play hockey and like that's his job you know like yes there's been a lot of flux getting the new arena getting the new training facilities you know that sort of thing you know and the arizona coyotes haven't been good but i don't know that it goes farther than that if that makes sense like i think it i feel like it's a little more cut and dry than we're making it you know well Again, as I mentioned, and maybe I need to restate this a little bit better. Um, no, I, I'm not trying to reflect necessarily Jake Chicker, and I'm trying to say that what he is representing, I think, you know, I think a lot of that deeper conversation is to those who aren't making that trade request is those because they're wondering because they look at the Arizona Coyotes as their future right now, and maybe perhaps in like a couple of years, and they're wondering where their future is going to be. And I think there's right. uneasiness there. That's what I was referring to for Chikrin. You're right. I wasn't trying to take that kind of depth with him because like, well, once you make the trade request, you I mean, it's just, you don't really care. Right. You're just yeah. like, well, I want to move on. But I think he does some of the points he brought up. I think there is a lot more of that discussion within the other players in the organization about, okay, so where is this whole thing going to end up? Yeah. And I think they're I just... all waiting for the whatever shoe to drop. Yeah, I guess my, my thought was if there's still a Gila River Arena, you know, I still think he does the same thing. It is because, no, because, no question. Just no because question. I think Arizona has really struggled, you know. And... Well, wasn't the original trade request about yeah. a year ago? Yeah, right. When they were yeah. still at, uh, well, before they almost kicked him out of the arena, meaning yeah. Gila River Arena yeah. for unpaid taxes. <laughs> yeah, not Chickard. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, he needs to get healthy first, too, though. He's really been plagued by that kind of Achilles injury that he had, too. So, but good hockey player. Um, was kind of linked maybe to the Minnesota Wild for a few moments, too, as far as a defenseman before Jacob Middleton uh, ended up in the fold because yeah. of that injury as well, too. Uh, mm -hmm. and speaking of uh, Jacob Middleton's former team, uh, the San Jose Sharks and National Predators will play regular season games October 7th and 8th at the O2 Arena in Prague. But Czech officials sent a letter to the NHL to point out that at this moment, the Czech Republic or any other state in the visa-free Schengen zone should not issue visas to the Russian players to enter the territory and that Russian players are not welcome. So digest that for a second and Good then luck. realize that Czech NHL great Dominic Hasek actually led the opposition to Russian players coming to Prague since the games were announced back in April. He said, yes, we don't want any promotion of the Russian aggression here. We're guarding our lives and the lives of our allies in the first place, meaning Ukraine. Nashville has forward Yakov Trenin and San Jose has forward Evgeny Svechnikov and defenseman Nikolai Nishkov, but of course he won't be available due to injury. So maybe one player on each side. It, yeah, weird. I mm -hmm. Well, first know, of all, the GM Mike Greer of San Jose, uh, they pressed him on it and he repeated it a couple of times as the NHL will handle it. Yeah. Um, and I think the biggest thing he said is we're a team, which means we either we all yeah. go or we all don't go. Right. Um, and I will, and 
I understand it to the level that we can, right? Noah, that, you know, I understand that there is this, I mean, because I mean, what is it we, between tennis and other sports that so they've banned Russian athletes yeah. for certain uh, tournaments. Um, but the, the, the key word here is promotion, right? So it's like, what yeah. is, you know, what, so is it you're promoting or their thought is, and maybe just the way they look at it. Um, and that's because where, it's like, more closer to home for them, right? Yeah. Or um, like, and like when I think of promotion, I think of like an Olympic event where it's like you actively represent your country as like if right. you're a tennis player, you are a single person representing your country versus like, you know, you look at uh, Trenton, for example, he represents the National Predators who play in the National Hockey League. Like, right. Now, to be fair, let's also put a little onus on the NHL for being sort of tone deaf here for even re remotely trying to schedule something overseas or maybe re not rethinking it a little bit, especially with some of those tensions. Um, I'm not saying that they're at fault, but you kind of yeah. wonder, you know, what the what the thought process was or maybe but, this but was what scheduled you, a long time but, but ago. But what, what do you want them to do? And the other thing is, what do you want Russian players to do? Like if you're a Russian player. That's what and, I mean. And, and, you, and you have like no affiliation or no, you know, endorsement for the war that's going on right now. Like well, you're just trying not. to, you're just trying to play hockey. It's like, right. you can't control where the San Jose sharks go and you just want to play hockey. And like, I think what's what I mean is, yeah. you know, it's, it's that, you know, it's like the whole, when they throw out the word promotion, it's like, they're not, it's like, like you said, they just mostly just want to play hockey. Now, yeah. maybe, maybe their fear is, and maybe this are dumb. Maybe the fear is maybe they would use it as a platform to, to do something. Um, I don't know that for sure. And like you said, maybe don't give a rat's rear end about yeah, what's happening. I, I, I think um, if anybody was trying to use a platform like that, they, they would be left in the Czech Republic. They wouldn't be coming back with the team they play for. And that's well, and that's the, that will you're, well, you bring up a good point because that's where, I mean, you're in a host country, right. For the NHL, you know yeah would you you know so would you put in certain protocols uh to try to avoid that knowing that you know you're kind of in a foreign consulate which means you're out of your control or would you risk yeah. that because again as your product of the nhl is your players right so even for the league is concerned you know what's the i guess what is the nhl gaining i know that they are trying to grow the game around the world which is great but there are also some times where you kind of question whether now was the right time. Um, and again, the yeah. Czech, you know, the Czech Republic, um, they've been, hello. I mean, huge supporters yeah. of hockey. What's some great names have come from there, including Dominic. Yeah. Hoshik, Dominic I guess th that's just, I go back to the other side though. And it's like, dude, if you're a Russian player and you play hockey, you just want to play hockey and you have the, here's the thing, just because you're Russian doesn't mean you don't have the right to do things. And we, and we talked about this uh, right. a couple months ago about like where you have, you know, uh, teams or players who have been banned well i think that kind of goes more to like again representing you know like the country of russia at a specific event it's like if you happen to be russian and you play for an nhl team i mean at what point do we say that's just a person living their life you know if, if they're a, if they were a businessman who was walking in to do a transaction at a bank and then leaving the country would you have the same question obviously the platform isn't the same but with that being said like at what point do we acknowledge that like there are Russian people who don't support the war or are indifferent to it and are just doing their daily things? You know? Well, and, and this is where we get into the, the the differences of countries we live in. Right. You know, the U.S., you know, we have the First Amendment where we have, you know, that freedom of expression, freedom of ideas. And whether we agree with it or not or say, what the heck are you? That's evil. They still can say it. Um, you kind of, and this is where you kind of wonder if there's you know, just more of a, a cultural difference too in the Czech Republic, and maybe just some of the things that they're concerned about. Um, so I think there is a difference of, I don't know if I, I don't know if standards the word, but you kind of wonder if that plays a part in it. I kind of think it does. Yeah, interesting. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on it. Three players I know won't be making a trip anywhere with an NHL team anytime soon. Our second to last topic: three big retirements in the national mm -hmm. hockey league not oh, often that that you and, see in the same day yeah crazy um and in fact i think uh two of them were both uh they both finished their careers um but were drafted 11 years apart uh mm -hmm. so that's kind of wild to think about zidane ochara is the oldest of course uh signed a one-day contract with the boston bruins and retired after 24 i'm going to say that again 24 
NHL seasons, 45 years old, a Stanley Cup, a Norris Trophy back in 2009, 680 points, over 1,680 games, the most by a defenseman Jeez. in the National Hockey League, and seven All Star teams to boot. Six foot nine blue liner was the tallest player in NHL history on, until Tuesday was the oldest active player in North American major professional sports. His retirement now makes Joe Thornton currently a free agent. The last active athlete in North American pro sports to have played back in the 1990s. Uh, So, yeah, you want to talk about someone who has spanned the testament of time and also close to the ceiling of whatever room that he's been in. Uh, Big Z finally hanging up the skates. Never thought we'd see the day, honestly. I figured we would. It's just a matter of when, right? And, you know, that's and that's the one thing that's kind of weird is that was with Chara, you know, with some of these bigger guys, right? It's either it works for you or it works against you, right? Sometimes yeah. you know, just having that extra, what's well, so that extra frame, and you know, sometimes you you kind of catch an injury bug or just something you just can't shake. And for him, he's been remarkably healthy throughout his entire career. He never, I know he he's kind of a tough guy, but he never really played a physical st- brand like in the corners or, you know, just he, he was able to really sustain himself. Uh, I think he took care of his body. Well, I think the style he played, he, he could be the aggressor when he needed to, but he wasn't like, you know, banging bodies every shift. Right. Um, and, and more so, you know, he played the game with a high IQ. I, I think he really did um, get underrated for just how well he played the, de- the game defensively. So a uh, heck of a career. Um, again, that spans back to, was it 96 was his draft year, if I recall? Yeah, New York Islanders, and Chris yep. went from the Islanders to Ottawa, and then Ottawa had the decision to keep, uh, him and Wade Redden were actually a defensive pairing, and they had the decision to keep one or the other, and the sense stuck with Wade Redden, and we saw how that turned out, so. About that. Yeah, um, the other two on this list, uh, staying up north in Canada, at least to start in Montreal, then Nashville and New Jersey, P.K. Subban retiring after Mm -hmm. 13 seasons. The 2013 Norris Norris Trophy winner was a three-time All-Star, 467 points in 834 games. His back kind of gave up on him in the latter stages Mm -hmm. of his career, unfortunately. So um, he's definitely going to have his own um, personal segment on NHL.com within the next couple of years. That's uh, It's already been confirmed. Um, And with that being said, I wouldn't be shocked if he has an analyst role very soon um, in the National Mm -hmm. Hockey League as far as just great media personality, um, great person in the community. His work, especially with children's hospitals up in Montreal, cannot be, you know, overstated enough. Um, No, not at all. I mean, I in his prime, P.K. Subban was one of the deadliest players in the National Hockey League. No question. Mm -hmm. No question. And I think. He un- he undeservedly, and I want to make this mention. He got, he got a lot of flack he did not deserve. Yeah. Um. And I get it. Like I I think he was, he sort of, I don't want to say break a beer because it's maybe not the right way to phrase it, but he sort of, you know, he gave hockey a personality where the game of hockey has been sort of this gentleman's, you know, tight knit sort of guy with a three piece suit and very professional sort of thing, right? Which is really kind of a vague way to say you're boring as all hell. But, um, you know, PK brought life outside the rink. He brought life inside the rink for a defenseman. Gosh, he was very mobile, very offensive minded. Again, how many over 400 points is something? What a half a point per game player. Yeah. Um, that's a good clip. Um, but then more so, I you cannot stress how much he impacted the Montreal community, especially in the children's hospital, what yeah. multiple millions of dollars. In fact, a wing in the hospital, he donated a ton of money to. So mm-hmm. you talk about an athlete and not just a hockey player, but a professional athlete who really did get it. Like he really did give back to the communities. Even when he left Montreal, I know that there was, it was sort of this weird dichotomy where he had the folks who were the PK Subban, shall we say haters, right? They're like, Oh good. He's gone. But then it's like, the community's like, my gosh, like, He's so embedded here. Like, this is actually a really tough loss. And I think Montreal, it, it took him a little bit, but I think they started realizing, you know, the, okay, kind of wish he was back. Uh, yeah. Heck and, of and, a career. And still ended up doing a lot of work coming back to Montreal yes. quite a bit, even to this day. So it's really good to see. Our last player here, journeyman defenseman Keith Yandel, after 16 seasons, mm-hmm. um, broke Doug Jarvis's Ironman record this past season by suiting up for 965 straight NHL games. Ended at 989 contests on April 2nd. He was a healthy scratch. Um, his stretch uh, ran. That. <laughs> yeah. His stretch ran from March 26, 2009 to March 29th of 2022. 
36 Crazy. years old, career high 62 points a couple of years ago in 2019, um, had 50 points or more in at least four separate seasons besides that year, um, retires with 103 goals, 516 assists in just over 1,100 games. So Heath Yandel, uh, another player who kind of dropped off the tail end of his career, but in his prime, mm-hmm. especially in, in Arizona or Phoenix, I guess I would say, right. um, was an absolute stud. He was, and and you know, you talk about defensive pairings that are synonymous with names. Uh, the Oliver Ekman Larson Keith Yandel defensive pairing was yeah. one of those back in the day, right? Where for whatever reason, and there's just there was there's no way to predict these things, Noah. But you just get on the ice with some guy, and whether it's on the four group or defensive group, and you just gel instantly. You just know where each other are. Um, your play styles complement each other, especially with blue liners, right? You usually have one, especially in today's NHL, the one that's kind of a little bit more offensively and the other one's kind of more laid back guy that loves to take their defensive responsibility. You definitely saw that uh, with these two in, in Arizona slash Phoenix. And I do think that, as you mentioned, you know, once he left Arizona, he was never the same player. Um, he just never was. Uh, he had a good cup of coffee with, uh, I think, Florida was the first destination. I think he was still OK. Uh, but as you the mentioned, rain, it was it was a, rain, Rangers had him, too. And that was kind mm-hmm. of the big deal, too. Yeah. So. And but it was a very sharp, unfortunately, like, you know, shall we say cliff dive for him? It just it was unfortunate because I think he was a better player than some of the showings after Arizona. And uh, uh, that would at least the stats would tell you um, that, as you mentioned, you know, sometimes you're in the, the, the best situation for yourself just with the players that are around you. And uh, he still had a quite the lengthy career. And uh, yeah, about the way that uh, Philadelphia. I was, was going to say quick that, question, quick wow. question. If they don't scratch him, does he play this year? Uh, that's a great question. And and I say that for this because there's two parts, you know, you're not retiring because you got your Ironman streak cut, right? But does it leave a very sour taste in your mouth? I would yeah. think so. Yeah. Um, because if anything, because here's the thing, like Ironman streaks, I mean, they're, they're arbitrary, right? It's not like they mean anything. You're not getting an award for it. It's sort of right. like a, a feel good moment. Dare we it's say? a pride thing. Yeah, It's a pride thing. But at the end of the day, like, you know, and, and he was in the worst scenario for that to happen. Meaning, if he was with any other team, um, I think either A would have ended earlier, yeah. dare I say. And what I mean is, and I'm not trying to disrespect Keith Handel, but we know he wasn't this. He wasn't the same yeah. player this year. He, you know, he, and again, he's battled injuries too. Um, but if you know the fact that they did it at the time that Philadelphia did, and granted, I can't fault Philadelphia completely. A hundred percent because they're also a gigantic mess and a half. Yeah. And when you, you know, after college and, uh, you know, some of these other guys that sign with them and they're trying to give them looks for a team that is essentially feeding at the bottom of the NHL, uh, st- you know, stat sheet. Um, it, it was sort of a perfect storm for Keith Yandel in that sense. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it probably was. I probably did give him something to chew on to say, OK, if uh, if if I can't do it, now if i'm if this is where my future is and i we know keith Andel prides himself in his play i think that maybe gave him something to think about i don't think it was the reason it probably was a reason a multiple that led him to his retirement yeah certainly looking at philadelphia by the way injury is quick little rundown here ryan ellis is expected to miss another season for the flyers it's a tough loss only four games for him five points in those four games though uh just plagued by injury a very consistent steady defenseman on the mm-hmm. other side their trade bait that headed to vegas nolan patrick will miss the entire season as well with an upper body injury sean nolan Kuturi, patrick's out again too oh yeah he's out for the entire year yeah holy cow yeah, um, plagued by injury again. Um, Sean Couturier for the Flyers, week to week with an upper body injury. He just got cleared and then got hurt again. Uh, Marco Scandella in St. Louis will miss six months after hip surgery. And in Toronto, two players, Timothy Lilligren will miss six weeks after hernia surgery. And forward Pierre Engvall has a foot injury and will be reevaluated next week on October 3rd. And welcome into the Huskies Warming House podcast, episode number 130. Um, yeah, wow, what a weekly roundup. We had a lot of meat and potatoes to actually get through there. So um, you got some bonus stuff here today. Um, speaking of bonus right. stuff, one of the things to, for us to pay attention here, um, I'm Noah Grant along with Nick Maxson, by the way. Um, I forgot to mention that. And we will be recording probably on Monday night next week um, for a variety of reasons, one of which being uh, St. Cloud State, the men's hockey team, plays Saturday, Sunday next weekend. So got to get both those recaps in as well. We'll keep you updated. Probably a Tuesday morning release, if not 
Wednesday at the latest. So we'll keep people updated on what our plan is there. Um, but Nick, before we talk about some women's hockey, NCHC, and then Minnesota Wild stuff, I think it's uh, fair to maybe announce this too, since we're on a podcast together. Mm -hmm. um, Nick, what are you doing in mid to late October? Anything exciting? I'm doing a couple of things at the end of this month, as well as the end of October as well. Um, we're going to be calling a game together. What the hell is this? Two um, yeah, two of them. Uh, the Minot Minotauros um, have asked me to fill in their play-by-play -play role for October 21st and 22nd up there in Minot. So you're welcome. Uh, getting a chance. Thank you uh, <laughs> to get behind the mic again. Uh, it won't be my first uh, go around, though, because I will be uh, SCSU fans. And uh, I'll post this on Twitter here probably on Monday um, that uh, you can't get rid of me that easy. I'm also going to be doing some women's hockey on Big Ten Network Plus as well this next weekend as the uh, women's hockey team will host RPI um, for their yep. first uh, non-exhibition weekend. Uh, so their first games that mean under uh, Brian Nadelski. So uh, kind of curious to see how this women's team uh, will look under a different uh, leadership group. Um Again, kind of it's it's exciting. Again, I know that we've I've pumped the women's hockey tires uh, the last two years. Um, it's I still want to because I still feel like there's there's a lot of that group that still has a potential to make giant strides. But uh, at the end of it, it's going to be yeah. um, early. Well, this way they have a, an exhibition yesterday um, against St. Thomas. Uh, we didn't find any stats or anything, yeah. but exhibition games, you know, it's. You know, not really about the stats or the score. No, it's yeah. more just trying to get some competition in there. And I think they have another one today, I yep. believe. They play um, the they play the Durham West Junior Lightning, and they right. are they are captain. Uh, their captains just got released on Friday too. Taylor Lind, um, the Manitoban mm -hmm. is going to captain this team with Tatum Geyer, Clara Himlerova, who of course had a great showing at the Women's Worlds a couple weeks ago, and also Hina Newland, who was a part of that tournament for Finland as well too. Um, she, mm -hmm. uh, those four are going to be the captains and assistant captains for the upcoming season so yeah like you mentioned can't wait september 30th october 1st friday saturday against rpi so yeah, yeah. fun yeah should be that? should be fun and then like nick said uh october 20 first camera, 21st, 21st and 22nd yeah yep. um it's going to be the aberdeen wings and minot minotauros yeah you're going to find us um for those who don't have hockey tv we'll also provide the facebook link if we can get that up too so people can check that out if you're a huskies fan and want to hear what nick and i would sound like together on on a hockey game you'll get your chance and some pretty good hockey to follow as well too so um a lot of exciting things going on here um as well as in college hockey on the men's side the nchc colorado college nick they finally did it and they look good. Oh, my They look goodness. really good. Oh. Um, so let's start with the other jerseys. The cleanest ones are the whites. So we're going to talk about those seconds because mm -hmm. those are just sexy. I'm th There's no other word to describe it. They are just The sexy. whites are good. The whites oh are really, goodness. really nice. So the yellow is here. The yellow is um, um, nothing really on the on the sleeves. The shoulders are, are a black top. I think they're kind of akin back to the 2000s, the kind of that clean yeah. cut look. Um, yep. We didn't get a chance to look at the socks, so I kind of wonder what they are. My guess, if I had to guess, would be – some sort of black stripe either down the middle or maybe at the bottom of the sock that kind of caps it off. We, I look, I looked through the video. We did not get a look at the socks for the yellows, um, not for the yellows. And I think they're probably just a generic instead of the whites, yeah. just, just a gold in with maybe the white, um, we didn't black. Call it, they, yeah, they, just, they don't, yeah, they don't have white on that, that, um, yellow jersey except for i believe around the numbers if i recall correctly it's a, it's so, a very limited white if it, yep. it's more of an accent like a piping color which, than anything which yep. makes sense because i think that cc is uh, shying away from they had those yellows a couple years ago that were heavy on the white and the gray and it didn't look well because you had three really light colors that were kind of working against each other mm -hmm. so um i like it I, I you know i think it's a good addition but oh those white jerseys, black bands, yellow trim have a little bit actually akin to the Minnesota wild style, actually with the yes. armbands and the trim. I think it might be very similar to that, but oh my goodness, do those look beautiful with the black yes, trim, black do. gloves, black helmets. When you were the one that actually tweeted it at our account and then I was able to see it because I was doing the Taros game last night. I mean, first impressions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unbelievably nice. Right. And I'm, I'm trying to actually pull up another picture here because I, I really do think they're that nice. Yeah. Um, so for, to give anybody 
uh, just kind of, uh, what do you call it? Like a preview of what they were. So the yeah. whites were kind of like that, just the front. And then you had the, the black sleeves that went from the shoulder all the way down to, to the mitts. So it was definitely more of an older, it was an outdated design. We'll give it that. Right. Um, it wasn't terrible, but it definitely needed a refresh. Uh, dare I say, I mean, look at the Minnesota wild logo behind you, um, for, uh, you know, your it's, Jersey. It's literally that style. It's almost, more, it's exact same banding style. on the bottom. Yeah. Exactly. So um, it looks really, really, really good. Um, I, I actually think, dare I say, that might be the better, best looking jersey in the NCHC, oh, dare yeah. I say. Yeah, um, yeah. that's going to look good. And mind you, the whites, opposite of the NHL, right? The whites are, that's their home uh, home yeah. uniforms. Um, again, the golds, it's it's a it's an alternate jersey more than anything. I think they're, the blacks are still technically their official road jersey, but. Yeah, um, as, as they should be. I mean, if you're as they CC, should be, yeah. If you're CC, you got to have a white jersey, you got to have an all black setup, and you got to have a yellow jersey. You have to. You just, you yeah, have to. You do. And uh, instead of on the whites, it was what Colorado College and the lettering that went kind of like from the, the, the right chest down to like the lower left admin, you know, so it kind of went diagonal. Just the big tiger logo in front. And like I said, geez, they look good. Yeah, they look really Very good. Very impressed. And that was where, you know, of course, they had the teaser video and, you know, CC in recent years, we've talked about their jersey threads and, you know, you kind of got that that feeling in your stomach. You're like, oh, boy, like, I hope this I hope this goes well. They've had a couple mm-hmm. of tough ones. And, and then you see the first whites and you're like, oh, yeah, this is going to go really yeah. well. We like yeah. this. Um, so or as Fallout 4 fans would say, everybody like that. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> very excited. Um, CC on the rise. And also, Nick, we should mention this right before we get into some Minnesota Wild stuff. How about besides our top two spots, the NCHC polling, picking our exact order for the previews that we yeah. did, uh, besides flipping Denver and North Dakota, which I get that. I'm not that surprised. And we can't be too perfect, right? Come on. Um, no. And, I, and, but, and But I was a little <laughs> bit surprised that we had so much parody related to us in the lower half, too. Well, and again, you know, as we we and we talk about this ad nauseum, but it's a preseason poll. We have no idea how this is going to shake out. This is just our we know, thoughts. We know everything down we to know, the point number. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, it's it, it means nothing. You know, you, you ask the players uh, when I was covering NCHC Media Thursday, they don't really look too much stock into it. In fact, I actually asked Brian Yoon, um, uh, the captain of Colorado College, who, uh, mind you, uh, he loves the jerseys. Mind you, he was actually part of that promo video. Yeah. Uh, again, their uh, second-year captain. Again, a Parker, Colorado native. Um I asked him, you know, do you kind of kind of feel like you're going to be the surprise of the NCHC? And he goes, we're a group that believes in ourselves. You were like, we really feel like this is the year we're going to be making strides. Like that room is buzzing. And dare I say, um, because it is Sunday and because I am in Vikings country and we're playing the Detroit Lions, um, <laughs> <laughs> I have to make it like that's a dangerous team. A dangerous yeah. team is one that's got more talent now, but also now they have the belief that they can compete. And again, kind of like for Detroit where I'm, I'm kind of half rooting for the Lions because they've been a team that's just been just not good for so long. You're just like, I kind of want them just to go on a run. And I do think CC is that team that's kind of be, will be like kind of like the darling um, of the NCT where I kind of want to see how far this team can go. And I do think they have a lot that they can go yeah. for. Yeah, really excited. If you missed, our season preview is one of the more successful ones that we did. Uh, we picked them to finish sixth in the NCHC. They've only done that one time since the NCHC's inception. Otherwise, finish in seventh and eighth. They could even go into fifth. They could even they could win the whole darn thing, Nick. Who's to say? Um, All right. So very excited. Uh, go check that out if you want. Um, of course, our last college hockey action will be on our extra ice session. We're going to talk all things St. Cloud State and the hometown men's team and their lineup chart. But Let's flip over down south, I should say. Uh, your neck of the woods around the St. Paul area, Nick. Uh, wild season preview here. How about this? Mm-hmm. Minnesota Club getting ready for their first preseason action today on Sunday. Last year, finishing second in the Central Division and second in the West. Lost in six games in the playoffs. So to St. Louis. Mm-hmm. They were outscored 22-16 to 16 in that series. The closest margin in any game was three goals. That happened twice in that series. The rest mm-hmm. of the games were all four goal Goals spreads. Out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, crazy. So overall, 53, 22 and seven last year, 31, eight and two at home, 22, 14 and five on the road, um, plus 57 in the goal category, 310, 253. So that's all the team stats I have, I promise. That's it. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, crazy. Um, as far as uh, team leaders in goals, it was Kirill Kaprizov with 47 goals. 
and six and seven more in the assists. playoffs. Oh my goodness. Um, 108 point season. Yeah. He was the statistical leader. No shock there. Uh, penalty minutes who led the team in penalty minutes. Any idea? Was it Ryan Hartman? <laughs> Brandon Duhame, uh, with 122, oh, mm-hmm. um, who led the team in plus minus any idea there? Ooh, it's either um, it's, Oh, was it Greenway or no, it was a Brodeen. As a defenseman, it was Alex Goligoski at plus 41 last season. Yeah, wow. interesting. Yeah, and so you wonder why he got that next shiny new contract, even though he maybe wasn't the most fleet of foot and production-wise right. over the tail end of last year. Uh, wins last season, Cam Talbot with 32. He's now playing for Ottawa. Played last night and uh, won a game, lost a game, I saw. Um, and then goals against average Mark andre Fleury with a 274 in his limited cup of coffee. So, Nick, this team uh, getting ready to kind of reset. Um, we'll go through the lineup chart we can a little bit too, kind of similar to what we're going to do for St. Cloud State. But beyond that, um, really the only notable pieces here, uh, John Merrill is still out with injury, as is Jordan mm-hmm. Greenway. They're expected to miss the first five to ten games of the season, so I have them both listed as scratches that are going to be in the press box and make their return very soon. But mm-hmm. uh, Nick, o- overall impressions of last season, Kirill Kaprizov did the thing, um, and... Yeah, there was actually a lot of player movement. Uh, Bill Guerin not shying away from not making a ton of moves, but making moves when he had to. And I think the other thing we'd be remiss to talk about, the loss of Kevin Fiala certainly hurts. Certainly hurts. And, you know, granted, you know, Bill Guerin's P public relations skills are kind of funny because, <laughs> well, while he, I think he keeps things close to the chest, there was definitely inklings throughout the last couple of years that when they signed Kevin Fiala, and even more so when they, you know, released both uh, Suter and Parisi that they knew that they had a limited time with Kevin Fiala. I think they all knew that. And granted, it hurt the fact that also in, in true Minnesota sports fashion that a freaking pandemic would cap the salary cap. Because let's not let's let's even let's even go as far as this, Noah. I still even let's say COVID never happened, and let's just also say that the salary cap still goes up a little bit every year. Yeah. You're still losing Kevin Fiala. You just don't yeah. have the cap space. But it's also created a secondary problem. You haven't been able to go out and free agency get someone kind of close, um, or as dare I say, another center. Uh, so, again, perfect storm, right? But yeah. that one hurts. Uh, losing 85 points in production is going to be tough to come by. I think that uh, Marco Rossi is no question going to be in this lineup, and I do think as much as they're trying to say he has to earn their roster spot, no. Uh, yeah, he does, but they well, are, they're counting on him. They well, are counting on him for sure. Well, we'll kind of get to that a little bit. Um, might be more interesting than you think, actually, because of another guy that we'll talk about here. Sam Steele. The, Sam Steele. Um, you know, yep. the, fir- the first part, too, that I kind of want to touch on, and this maybe goes back to looking ahead at Matt Boldy in a couple of years, too. Uh, Bill Guerin, in fact, I, I had it up here, so let me pull it up so, so I don't lie to people because Lord knows I love to do that. Uh, $5.738 million uh, in cap space right now for the Minnesota Wild. Mm-hmm. Um, sit on that, man. Don't yes, do anything sit with on it. it. Sit on that, uh, especially with the cap hell coming the next couple of years with the Parisi Suter contracts, knowing you have to re-sign Matt Boldy if he produces even close to what he did last year. Um yeah, that's good found money for the Wild based on the Cam Talbot trade and the Dimitri Kulikov movement. Now, on on that same token, Noah, what it does do is, dare you say, somebody is having a tumultuous year. It does give you some flexibility to make a move, right? So yeah. um, I'm with you. I know that, you know, whether it's Russo or somebody has speculated that there was another move coming. I'm not so I'm not so sure. Yeah. Um, and now that we're in a training camp, I think the chances that have really decreased. Um, and I kind of feel like I'm with you. I feel like that this is a poker chip for later. Um, I think yeah. that uh, it's more so, OK, um, we're, we're positioned well. We're going to be relying on some of our younger talent, a.k.a. Marco Rossi, and maybe somebody else if yeah. someone shows in camp. Yeah, don't forget, Kalen Addison is in the last year of his deal. Yes, so, Kalen Addison. Know. So uh, like you mentioned, you have not only that to worry about, mind you, you have technically like three million because you got to remember it's now fourteen point seven million that adds yep. next season, so it's two more million with those uh, contract buyouts as opposed to this year. So yep. it's not as much as you think, and I, I'm with you. I think that that is just more extra space for now. Again, half of that's going to be going by the wayside, and uh, it gives you some not only for call ups but injuries, but also 
dare you say, like I mentioned before, if you need to make a midseason move, you're not completely strapped and um, would have to give up something to get something else in. So it, it gives you some flexibility in, in a position where I didn't think many people thought we would have any uh, going into this season. You have some. Yeah, Tyson Jost, uh, Sam Steele, Matt Boldy, and Brendan Duhame on the forward side are all, are all RFAs after this season, and Freddie Gaudreau mm-hmm. is only UFA in the forward group. Defensive-wise, it's only Matt Dumba, Matt who's, ex- Dumba. who's expiring after this season, and Philip Gustafson in net is an RFA after next year or so, or this year, excuse me. So, um, yeah, a lot of things to play with. I think lineup card-wise here, um, you want me to just throw my lineup card out, and then you can disagree sure. with me heavily? I um, like that. Okay, you want to start – uh, with the forwards, sure. We, okay. Let's go. Let's go uh, top to bottom. Okay, sounds good. Uh, well, I've got Kaprizov uh, and Zuccarello next to Ryan Hartman in the middle. Um, at oh, least geez. to start the season. Um, how'd you get that? that? How'd you get that line? You know, a <laughs> lot of mathematical calculations. I, I brought the 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 math. Uh, the little whatever you call it. I was gonna say the math beads, but then I I, I didn't like the phrase. It's called the that slide. Thing. It's called the slide ruler. Yeah, that thing. Um, yeah, I like that a lot better. Um, although they, they both have euphemisms of which we're not going to discuss at all. Um, uh, Erickson Eck in the middle with uh, Marcus Foligno on the right. Uh, Jordan Greenway is probably going to slot back in the left in that when he comes back. But right now I have Adam Beckman solely for the reason that Adam Beckman is going to get his preseason camp uh preseason game trout in that slot tonight. So we're gonna, so. Yep. gonna see where he's gonna be there. Um, this is where it gets difficult. Um, I have Matt Boldy. And mm-hmm. Freddie Goudreau as yep. left wing and right wing. Um, Marco Rossi or Sam Steele. Sam Steele has yep. looked really good in training camp in that spot. So that's why I put it. But one of those two, I think, will be there. Yep. Fourth line, Connor Dewar on the left, Brandon Duham on the right, and either Tyson Jost, Sam Steele, or Marco Rossi there. Mm-hmm. And then Steele, Rossi, or Jost as the other healthy scratch in addition to Jordan Greenway. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like, it's these kids um rossi and steel of course steel has nhl experience and then joe's gonna have to come back this is weird because the minnesota Wild and freddie Gaudreau can play center too um let's not mm-hmm. forget that um very good defensive center too yeah let's not forget that the wild there's been a concern for their depth at center now they don't have primo guys i you know eric right. is probably their best centerman over ryan hartman and he is no at, question at, at best on a good nhl team a second line center um mm-hmm. The Wild have center depth here. It's just not, oh my God, eye-popping. But it's young, and it's moldable, and it's... Unproven, But it's opportunity. Well, and, and, you know, the the one thing I will say that I think... I know everybody wants to put Marco Rossi with Matt Boley to start. I kind of think he won't get that right away. And here's here's why I say that. I think they really are trying to be cautious with Marco. um, And I think you will see him start on the fourth line just to kind of get him into the game flow. Again, you know, he went through so much, dare I say hell, right. With just yeah. with his, you know, COVID and all the different side effects with his heart, trying to get him back in. Uh, it's not a slight on him. I just think that they're going to be cautious to kind of get kind of just sort of dip his toes in the water. And then I think you'll see him eventually get to the third line. Um, yeah. But I, I think Sam Steele is there. I think Beckman does get, into the lineup. And then when Jordan Greenway comes back, I do feel like Beckman is the guy that gets sent back down to Iowa. So, so we're in, initially, so we're in agreement. The like, Caprizov, Hartman, Zuccarello. Yep. Um, There's no way you're touching that line. Be- Beckman slash Greenway, Erickson, Eck, and Foligno. Yep. So yep, you're not, th- you're not breaking up Erickson, Eck, and Foligno. No. So third line, Boldy, Steele, Goudreau. Which, the only, is, what they, which yeah. is what they've been in camp, and they've looked really good. You could also put Duhaim. I believe that they put Duhaim up there with Felino and Eric Snack just because he plays that more of that physical, gritty yep. style, too. I think that's another piece you could, you know, sort of interlace in that lineup, depending yeah. on the look that you want to give as well. Yeah, especially if Greenway takes a little bit. Maybe you start him on the fourth line and give him limited minutes till he feels good. So mm-hmm. here's the thing. Connor Dewar on the left here. Are yep. we okay with that? Um, okay with and, that. and then Duhaim, Beckman, Greenway, <laughs> sure, right. Some mix, okay. Uh, Marco Rossi, Tyson Jost, man. And you know, here's the funny thing. You know, when you've got guys like so, Tyson Jost supposed to have a little bit more offensive flair. You have like guys like you know, uh, Duhaim slash uh, Connor Dewar, a little bit more sandpaper type s. Yeah, that's kind of nice to have a little bit. Uh, you know, yeah. guys with different skill sets. Because I think if there's any one thing. Going back two years ago, they felt like they weren't physical enough against Vegas. 
they um, tried to address that last trade deadline, bringing in Nick Delore. Now, granted, Delore, I think uh, he brought physicality. I think there was other parts that were you know, they weren't happy about with him um, just because I don't think that he executed some of the things on the fork check they were hoping he would. Uh, but other than that, I mean, it's a decent balance um, on yeah. the forward group. And I think you have some parts that you can intermix. And I don't think you really, you can look at the lineup and I don't think in the forward group, you can say that there's one or two specific players that are going to be the quote unquote healthy scratches night in and night out. I yeah. don't think that will be the case for a second. I there you say you can't look at one or two. That's going to be the guy. And I'm like, I don't know. Kirill's pretty good. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the forward group, you know, it's interesting because you have, you have a lot of young depth and this is a team where Minnesota is in a u- unique position where they could still, you know, make the playoffs obviously. Um, but do it on the backs of some of these young kids and get them mm-hmm. integrated into what could be the next core of this franchise. And they could do it while losing 12 to $14 million a season in cap for nothing. Like, right. Oh my gosh, dude, pretty impressive. Crazy. Um, uh, any, any other comments we want to make on the forward side here? No, I think we covered it. All right. Sounds good. Uh, defensive side. Uh, I have Jake Middleton next to Jared Spurgeon. Um, even though that sounds like that's going to get split. Yeah. Um, Here's why um, th- I may I might I might have maybe put a little bit more of a risk here on this one. Uh, second pairing, Kalen Addison and Jonas Brodine. So essentially you were already putting Matt Dumba out on the trade block. No, I'm putting Matt Dumba in the third pairing with Alex Goligoski. Sheltered minutes, power play specialist with a defensive defenseman and Alex Goligoski with a great plus minus able to wheel and deal in limited minutes. Um, now. Is that fair to Matt and Dumba? No. But the reason being is that otherwise, I think Dumba goes back up with Brodeen. Do you want to put Jake Middleton down with Alex Goligoski? Kalen Addison is not a third-pairing defenseman. We've had this discussion before. Not to, say, not to say he couldn't play sheltered minutes with Goligoski. I could see it. Um, the right side, I think, is set. Spurgeon, Brodeen, Goligoski. I think mm-hmm. in that order, one, two, three pairing, they stay. The left side is just a little bit different. And I could see any combination besides Matt Dumba being in that top pairing. Um, that's the thing is, do you feel Kalen Addison can make enough of a jump where he's a top four defenseman? Because on paper, skill set wise, projection wise, he is a top four defenseman. He's not a third pairing prototypical defenseman. Jake, no. Middleton, Jake Middleton maybe fits that mold. So maybe, you know, Matt Dumba is a top four defenseman, at least to start the season. I just, I think there's, they're going to find some way if Kalen Addison makes this team out of camp to keep him out of that bottom pairing and let him kind of run and gun a little bit as a power play specialist as well, too. And when they, when they need a quarterback on the power play, um, and that has kind of been his MO, right? He's been really good at that. And dare we say the power play the last couple of seasons has been bad. And that's maybe putting it lightly. Yeah. Um, so especially consist- uh, consistency yeah, wise. Tr- streaky would be my better. Streaky. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I, I think you're right on one thing. I think that at least from what we've seen in the reporting, too, is that the coaching staff wants to try uh, Brodine and Spurgeon just because of the foot speed. Sure. And then they want to uh, put Middleton down with Addison. So even they are saying, hey, Addison has a chance to be in that second pairing. And uh, I, I'm with you. I, I think Galagoski knows he's kind of going to be in that third pairing role. And, and again, the question is going to be, how do you manage Matt Dumba? I'm um, actually I'm actually excited to see Galagoski in a third pairing role. I think that's a perfect fit for him. A guy who's a third pairing D-man, maybe kills a penalty or two, can slot in on the power play if somebody gets hurt. Um, you know, I, I, I like it. I, I think he's, you know, he's, what is he, 36 now? I think he's 35 yeah, he's or 36. Um, I, I think he's maybe I could pull it up because I have kept friendly up, but I think he's very serviceable in the role that he has right now. And that's the thing that, you know, I look is that uh, 37, sorry. Um, and that's the thing where, you know, you've got him under contract for two more years. He kind of reminds me of like Nate Prosser with a sprinkle of skill, you know, at this point yeah. in his career. And, and uh, here's the other piece that we haven't touched on too, right? Is what do you do with Goligoski and John Merrill when he's healthy? Do they, do they rotate that out or so I mean yeah, you're, you're not taking Matt Dumba out of the lineup just because again we're, we're all waiting for him to re you know to sort of find his offensive touch which yep. I I'm I think all of us are starting to I don't want to say doubt but he hasn't shown the ability yep. lately that he's been able to find it again yeah uh, I had I had John Merrill and Andre Schuster as the scratches so. Schuster yep yeah. and that's the thing Andre Schuster I mean God isn't he like six foot eight isn't he huge yeah he's a big guy let's see here if we can pull up his stats here while you're uh, so so again you know you have pieces you can intermix 
both front and the back end. Um, Six, and, seven, two, seventeen. Yeah, he's he's a big dude. Um, he, he's not going to low bridge you like uh, Andre Markov, though, for Montreal. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, so there's a lot to like a little bit here. Right. So you, you have you can put out different personnel against different opponents to try to whether it's whether the storm or, or be the more of that offensive push type team or be maybe more stronger, bigger defensively, be more of a gritty type team. Um, and dare I say, Bill Guerin's done this and also have had extra cap space to work that's, with. It's kind of that, impressive. Yeah, that's the strength of good teams, too. You look at a prime example, I think, a good comparison, the Pittsburgh Penguins, a team that, you know, mm-hmm. kind of have some serviceable guys in their bottom six, third pairing. But even when they went down with a lot of injuries, they had guys who could fill in and be serviceable. And I think that's what Minnesota and Bill Guerin. Hey, Nick, where did Bill Guerin come from? Hmm, Pittsburgh. Yeah, ironic, huh? Um, interesting hmm. that interesting that you look at that that way. Um, goaltending wise, Nick, I think Mark Andre Fleury and Philip Gustafson actually two things. One, I believe Jesper Walsbet at some point gets a chance to back up or play in the NHL this season, at least a game or two. Well, I think you're right, but I think it's also a you know. Dare we say, if there's an injury to either one of those goaltenders, it might be sooner than we'd like. Yeah, I yeah. will say Philip Gustafson, who's only like 23 or 24, of course, 2018 World Junior uh, Champion, I believe, was Sweden. Um, or had, so, had, yeah. had a really good uh, save percentage in GAA there. Um, I'm actually really excited about him. Losing Cam Talbot is tough, but I'm actually really excited. I know it's a contract year for him playing on an Ottawa team that was not so good last season. I actually think knowing Marc-Andre Fleury is not going to carry the load this year, you know, and Fleury has recognized that, yes, they're going to tag team a little bit here. Yep. I'm excited to see what he can do. I, to be honest, I think this could be a really great problem for the Minnesota Wild. Yes, for Wallstead's going to get his development. Gustafson's mm-hmm. going to determine his own fate. He's going to do really well. Wild are going to be happy. Or if he struggles, you send him down to Iowa and you give Wallstead a look. I, I still think another criminal mastermind a little bit here by bill garrett honestly it's well and again we we talked about you know the cam Talbot situation and, and how things developed when they re-signed mark andre Fleury. um i get it Talbot wants to be the number one guy he felt like he earned a number one job uh wasn't going to get it in his mind i think bill garrett did the right thing even though there were some public comments that he made this doesn't have to do anything uh right. i think he realized that that wasn't going to work and that was going to possibly percolate into the locker room and cause more problems off the ice. So I'm yeah. glad that he at least recognized that and dare I say made the, the right decision. Um, but like you said, uh, Mark Andy Fleury, you know, he's what 37, 38 years old. He, he's not the spring chicken that he was. He's still a great goaltender. He's no, you know, he's, he's a three-time Stanley cup winner. Like, uh, likes to sell tape Sidney Crosby's gear into a ball. That was fantastic by the way. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that's the biggest reason why he's here too, is that he is a locker room guy as well. Like through and through yeah. he's a veteran guy. Uh, I think him and Gustafson, again, a younger goaltender could learn some things from Mark Andre Fleury. And as you mentioned, the wild in terms of depth, Jesper Wallstead is there if you need him. Now I think they're yeah. going to try to not touch him if they don't have to. They will um, be splitting the game tonight, Wallstead and Flurry, um, in call or against Colorado tonight. So they we will get yeah. a chance to see Wallstead and how he can respond against the abs here. So yeah, and uh, get his first taste of you know some of the bigger shots. I, I remember David Rennick uh, going back to our St. Cloud uh, years, right? We're gonna you know. You know, he talked about when he was uh, in the off season back in the uh, in Slovakia, and he was uh, practicing against Tomas Tatar, and just you know, I don't know if awestruck was the word he used, but you know, just he, he you could notice the difference in the power and the accuracy of the shots. And uh, yeah. uh, Wallstein will definitely get a taste of that today, and will be curious to see how well he performs, uh, seeing some NHL talent. Simple game, small biscuit, big basket, like they say. I uh, well, we've got our basket of fan questions here. Not a ton, but you know, a fair amount, a little a couple of them. Uh Derek Felska asks, how many points will Marco Rossi have this season with the Wild? And if he somehow doesn't make the team, should fans or the team be concerned? And if he can't make it as an NHL center, would that be a big miss? I have my opinion, but Nick, floor is yours. Of course, you start me with this one. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think I think you and I are on the same page. I'm just going to throw my brave wave, brain, my one existing brain wavelength to you. So I think so. <laughs> uh, number one, uh, no, um, you should not be concerned uh, because again, players take the different development paths, yeah. right? And from what what we've seen, and first of all, what he's had to go through to get to this point. 
Um, yeah. Not every player, not every athlete, I should say, even just talking hockey, goes through something yeah. that's that kind of a medical debilitating type um, you know, cardiac, time is, cardiac um, issue that he yeah, had and, you know, and, because of COVID. And, yeah. My, and, myocarditis is what he had, which means an inflammation right. of the myocardium around your heart. That's the all muscle, I'm gonna, yeah. yeah. The muscle. And, yeah. There you go. Yeah. That. Well, and at the end of the day, right. <laughs> that, that condition is not just a COVID thing. It happens. Right. Yep. And there are times where as a human body, right. That doesn't get back to the level of, dare we say health that would yep. allow someone to continue to perform at the highest level to be a professional athlete. Right. So, and, and to be able to, to go through, to take the punches, to can get back. I mean, it was a long process, right? I mean, he's done it. So I have all the confidence that Marco Rossi will not only be on this roster, yeah. but also will be a, a player that will perform. Wait. I think he gets 30 points. Um, but to, to say, you know, to kind of go from one extreme, to how many points he's going to get, and then to ask the question, what if he doesn't, would it be a concern or disappointing? Well, no, because why Why would that be disappointing, right? Yeah. Play, uh, you, played really well in Iowa, too. I mean, he's right. done everything so, at every level. And I mean, the dude's 21. Like, and that's the thing, right? It's that you're still young. So I don't know how you can ask, you know, the two extremes and the same question, um, to be perfectly honest with you. And and number and number two, at the end of the day, right? Um, he's going to be a rookie. There's going to be growing pains with him. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing that you care about Rossi is not his point production, but how is he playing the game, right? If he yeah. ends up getting only 10 points, um, sure, I think all of us, for any player we watch, we want them to have 100 points, right? I think that's just a natural instinct we have. But yeah. let's be realistic. You know, Marco Rossi, you know, with any player that makes the jump to the highest and the best league in the entire world, there's going to be things he's going to learn, including the speed of the game, in different systems under Dean Evison. So we hope it's a seamless transition, but I wouldn't call anything this would be like a disappointing year because he's going to be a full on rookie and there's going to be things he's going to have to still learn and develop. And I'm actually excited to see how he uh, lives Handles up to the it. challenge. Yeah. yeah. Um, Liam Ogren, by the way, his first action in Iowa, by the way, too, we get to see him as the opening, uh, one of the opening draft picks yes. um, as, as well um, moving into I'm, this season. But uh, you know, here's the thing that also don't forget Nick Patan, by the way, another good depth forward for the wild should they yep. need him. Um, here's the thing, like you mentioned, I was going to say 25 points. So I like that 30 point marker. Um, if he doesn't make the team, should they be concerned? No, because Tim Army in Iowa does a fantastic job. They'll be fine. Yep. Um, the other thing, if he can't make it as an NHL center, would that be a big miss? Here's my answer. What if he's still playing in the show and producing? Just because he's not a centerman, is that, is that an issue? Yes, you want center depth, but is that an issue? Like, if the dude can play, the dude can play. Like, that's... Well, and that's just <laughs> it. Like, if you have the talent, uh, part of what's on the coach's job right is to put him in a position to be successful right so maybe yeah. he moves to the wing and maybe he gets more points because maybe that's where they need they need more offense but again you know centerman and dare we say we've said this ad nauseum no is that you know there there there's so much more responsibility laid on the center in terms of especially in the defensive zone um offensively i think you have to look at the game a different way they're considered more of the playmaking you know not the finishing type now again the nhl with Sidney crosby of getting milk and they've, they've kind of been uh shall we say some uh yeah, evolution to the center position. Maybe that's yeah. the best way to phrase it. But at the end of it, again, um, if if he started at center, then ended up moving to the wing just because they want him to to maybe have a little bit more freedom offensively, not worry about it. As you mentioned, if he's got the skill set, why be worried about it? Yeah, certainly. Uh, we'll come back. He's got one more question, a little bit less hockey esque. So we'll come back to that one in a, in a second here. Uh, Tinner Heath. Um, yeah, how many games will Sam Henches get called up for? Um, Zero. Yeah. Hate to be that guy, um, you know, and here's the thing, you know, with a flux in the roster, if you get an injury or two, not to say it couldn't happen. Um, you know, I think he's, he's got more of a chance right now than he did in April. I'll say that much. Yeah. Um, but just looking at the guys in front of him and that's nothing against Sam. It's just, there's some really good hockey players in front of him, unfortunately. It's, well, it's just, it's the same, like we're talking about Neil's Lundquist, right? Uh, the trade, you know, requests from New York to Dallas, right? There's, it's not that, it's on the particular player. It's more of like yeah. just the guys that are ahead of them. The depth chart is just that good. I mean, yeah. Are we I talking about the wild having depth at Ford? Are we really yeah. talking about that? I would, I would love I for so. Sam. Yeah. I would, we love Sam as a guy too. And as a player, uh, we would love for him to prove us wrong. I mean, it would be great to see him in a wild sweater, you know? Right. I mean, it, and it's, and again, this, 
we can say this ad nauseum again. It's not a indictment on Sam. It's more of when you take a look at the entire roster, you see the depth chart. I don't think as of right now, and he, he like you said, when you yeah. have a full season in Iowa, you have a chance to climb that ladder. I think yep. as it stands right now, his chances are very, very small. Why I said zero, I'm going to stick by that. I'm going to hold my guns. And here's the thing. It's like if he's developing with Tim Army and he's making impressions down there, you you know, you you better believe that when Bill Guerin calls down, Tim Army doesn't sit in silence and not tell you who's being successful. Production is production. If Sam's doing well and you get an injury bug, he could be the guy, you know, not to take. take, I mean, he's young. He's young like all these guys are. Nick, um, if if I'm not mistaken, uh, last St. Cloud player to play in an NHL game for the Minnesota Wild would be John Lazat. John Lazat. Yep. So uh, less, yeah. less, less than ideal performance, but uh, yeah, it, he's not the most fleet of foot, but I mean, no. Hey, that's the thing. That is where the injury bug things can happen. And he par- carved out a pretty good career for himself so far. I would say um, mm-hmm. only, only two more questions slash three. Um, Caleb asks, uh, okay. as it's currently constructed, do you see the wild making a deep playoff run or better yet? Will the pucks cry by us dinner at Cassetta's? <laughs> First of all, Cassetta's sounds amazing. So I will. I've never been. That. Wow. It's uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's probably a little more hyped up than it probably like if you're a food critic would say, Just but like North Dakota, right? Yeah. It's a, <laughs> let's not put North Dakota and Cassetta's in the same conversation. Hey, you're, hey, you're going to be here within the next. I know. Month. I know. With that. I know. Pizza ranch is going to be like the thing. Um, <laughs> so... Oh yeah, we do. Have, I was like, I was going to say we don't have them, but we do. And I know where it is. Uh Oh, <laughs> It's going to be just on the opposite corner where you're at from the gas station. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> it's, actually, uh, it's actually part of the gas station. Thank right. you. <laughs> um, deep playoff run. Hot take. No. That's not that hot of a take. Um, no, I do. Um, I will say this, though. I think this group is going to surprise and make it to the second round. Why do I say that? One, because I'm stupid. But number two, <laughs> number two, uh, Nick's like, OK, you said it on me. But number two, I think this is the group that ekes into the playoffs and does some damage all of a sudden they have that no expectation, no pressure. Thank God. We're still in the playoffs with this young group, even though they took a step back by losing Kevin Fiala and maybe had an injury bug and maybe Mark Andre Fleury had a nine, 10 and still push this team to the playoffs. And then they're going to do some damage. They're going to find some magic. And this is the year that they make it to the second round solely because of that, because how Minnesota sports would that be to bring our hopes up, bring us into the second round and then collapse and burn um, in six games in the second round. Um, well, but it, deep playoff run. Uh, when we talk deep playoff run, that's Western Conference final no. at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's, no. it's, it's going to be tough. Again, you have a stacked Central Division, uh, the Pacific Division. I mean, you talk about a team that's going to make the biggest jump to me. It's the Los Angeles Kings, honestly. Um, yeah. With just some of the additions that they have, I, I like their balance. I think Cal Peterson is ready to take the take the reins over from Jonathan Quick. No, no pun intended. You know, you know um, the, the thing that sucks is, I mean, a little bit more goalie solidification with Talbot and Flurry at the end of last year helped. Um, really it all stems to one guy nick it all stems yeah. to kevin fiala um yeah, it really that, does that 85 mm-hmm. points and having him being serviceable even you know you, you had more viable options yes you got the young kids but like nick bukestad was still like a proven commodity in in the fact mm-hmm. that you knew what you were going to get with him so right. a little bit of fluctuation but let's not forget i mean nick delorier was a fourth liner for this team and i would say doer joe Steele, rossi do him they're all better than him you know so i mean right there, there's certain options here where i think minnesota could have a little bit of magic but you got to stay healthy Number yes, one, gotta you got to replicate the success that Kaprizov, Hartman, Zuccarello had. If they don't replicate the success or for whatever reason, Zuccarello and Kaprizov don't connect this year. Um, that's a whole issue that I don't even want to think about. Um, that won't happen, but sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the thing, though. You, you think about uh, Zuccarello and how not a disappointment, but how much he was kind of middle of the pack until Kaprizov came along and revitalized his career a little bit, too. Um, you know, not to say that I can't. You know, you hope it doesn't disappear, but not to say it can't not happen. Um, you know, just right. like how just like how Rossi could score 50 points this year, he could also really struggle. I mean, there's ebbs and flows, the extremes either way. I mean, it's right. It's possible. Um, we don't know. Right. We just don't know. We we don't know. Um, uh, last question here, Nick. Uh, do you like the shout goal song? I actually do. Yeah, I do, too. I don't I actually it. do. Um, it's uh, the shout song or the, the Joel uh, Santriani one that they had for a while. Yeah. Um, it was due for a change. Um, I didn't mind the Prince thing, you know, with just what things saw, have happened. I saw Austin Matthews talking about um, Hall and Oates, um, their goal song too. Yeah. Um, but Toronto, actually, yeah. yeah. He doesn't like it. I actually like it. I think it's a good little goal song. Like, bring energy in. Like, it just it feels right, like and, a, a good bridge of classic versus modern. 
Yeah, and you know? I kind of wonder at some point, are we, as the NHLers, what, who's going to be the first team to actually personalize the goal song? At yeah, some yeah, point, that's coming, player. I think. Yeah. yeah, I think that's coming sooner than later. I would say yeah. the next five years, and dare I say, maybe Toronto will be the one to do it just because say, of Austin Matthews. I say I wouldn't worry about it because I wouldn't put the bucket in the back of the net anyway. But well, they can't final, get that's the first round either, so it's fine. Final two <laughs> questions here, um, and these are coming from me. Um, that would be at SCSU Hockey 91. Uh, oh boy. Uh, I'll just lump them together, Nick. Biggest strength, biggest weakness for this club. And biggest moreover, strength. And, and moreover, what are you also excited about too? Biggest strength to me is going to be their top four defensemen. Um, I really, truly feel like with Spurgeon, Brodeen, um, what I believe is going to be Kalen Addison um, and along with Jake Middleton, I think that they have a solid top four pairing. I also think that even their third pairing defenseman is going to be solid. Again, the one thing that disappointed every one of us was how John Merrill and Dmitry Kulikov, the regular season, were actually surprisingly pretty good. And then for whatever reason, like not only did the wheels fall off, but you fell off a cliff and then crashed and exploded into a ball of flames uh, come to the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs. Is, is um, that the wild or this podcast? I, I can't right. remember. Uh, it might be both, <laughs> uh, which means we know. So <laughs> 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 we know how this goes. Uh, but I do really think the defensive core is going to be a strength because that's going to help the goaltending situation, especially when you have flurry that tends to, he can get a little, shall we say, uh, feet happy. Uh, sometimes yeah. it gets a little bit uh, to he wants to be do a little bit more than just be in the crease. Uh, we, we've seen that in the past. So I think that that's going to be a big part of uh, a complimentary piece to them. And then uh, what I'm most excited about is to see we said it before, but I think Marco Rossi, I think I'm, yeah. I'm excited to see his uh, introduction to uh, the NHL schedule. I'm, I'm excited to see him move up and down the lineup. I think a few times, I think, I think you'll see maybe a scratch or two here and there just to try to keep his confidence up, but yeah. I want to see his progression. Um, and how does the Minnesota wild um, try to recapture those 85 points lost with Kevin Fiala? That to me is the most intriguing yeah. question for this group. Biggest weakness. <sighs> Goaltending. I actually think it's goaltending. And I know that's going to be kind of weird, but uh, Gustafson has been okay. Um, but again, not a great team. So I think there's kind of unfair to plug it in. But for yeah. Flurry, we, we know when Flurry's on, he's he's very good. But there's also been times, and again, he's older in his career, where um, he has not looked very sharp. Um, and yep. I think, you know, I, I know a lot of people point to game one of last year for the Stanley Cup playoffs. I don't put that on Mark Andy Fleur at all nope. um, because you put him in cold. I was curious as to why you just didn't stick with Cam Talbot. And yeah. if you were the whole plan wasn't it obviously was to me you were going to start Mark Andy Fleury. Why didn't you give him a couple of games um, or at least three to get him warmed up before the playoffs. So that way you weren't putting in Julia, the cat Gaffney to stop Gunnar stall, a cold goaltender. I just don't get it. Uh, so <laughs> yes, old D two reference. I don't care. Um, but I just, again, uh, I think goaltending might be the weak link with the Minnesota wild. Oh, geez. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> wow, that, um, wow, that I got your funny bone there. Didn't yeah. I? <laughs> it, it doesn't come out often, but sometimes it's here. Um, that's actually a lie. I'm a very smiley and happy human being for those who know me. Um, and also funny enough, we were talking with Caleb last night about my cheesy bread incident a couple years ago with the North Dakota <laughs> uh, Hawks. Well, Nick will be happy to know that we get our uh, food delivered straight to the press box for free in Minot. So no cheesy nice. bread on anybody there. Um, well, the cheesy I bread, it, there was no, cheesy bread it was uh you marinara. To, it was the yeah. marinara sauce and uh, dare we say your basketball skills and uh, yeah, yeah but i mean it, it was it was the north dakota broadcast team is anyone complaining no <laughs> um here, here's the deal uh biggest weakness i think for the minnesota wild power play right now i look at this mm -hmm. uh lineup and i it's hard to pin you know not necessarily a first unit but a second unit that's really going to be effective especially on the forward side at least to start um right. but i think there's a lot of growth that can be had there so i think power play right now for me uh biggest strength serviceability for sure um the ability for a lot of these young guys to really get a chance i think opportunity sometimes breeds success a little bit when you have guys who you know are not complacent in things they're willing to bring that extra gear night in and night out to try to make a lineup i'm very excited and i think you've got a lot of guys that can play in a lot of different areas we actually have a, a fair amount of centermen that at least have some experience playing center that mm -hmm. also can play wing very effectively too so i think that's very exciting um as far as the biggest strengths so um last and final question before we head out to extra ice here nick uh where did the minnesota wild finish this season standings wise oof uh in the division or Wherever I have them first wild card spot. That's where I have them. 
honestly. Yeah. Um, Central I, Division's I, not that strong this year. Um, you know, Colorado's going to be good. St. Louis is going to be good. Um, mm-hmm. That third spot's up for grabs. I actually think Nashville is going to make a big jump this year. I agree. Um, you know, Winnipeg's it, a mess. <laughs> very much so. Yeah. Um, Winnipeg might Chicago's be Chicago's uh, a mess. Sh- Arizona's sh- a mess. Yeah. So you have. You have a very uh, what do you call it? You've got two extremes of the central division this year. Um, yeah. You got some top heavy teams, and you have some teams that are fighting for Connor Bedard. Uh, I guess you know. <laughs> oh, you, see the, you see the goal he scored the other night, by the way, too. I, Nasty. Maybe, yeah, that between the legs, or maybe there was a replay. I can remember. I saw it on my feet. I was like, oh my gosh, this kid's disgusting. Um, yeah. But I think you know, Wild and Wild Card One, and Dallas and Wild Card Two. Um, I mean, well, there's nobody else did. I mean, nobody else. But here's the thing, and that's that's probably and. Because if you look at the Pacific, it's Calgary, Edmonton, and LA. Yeah. And Jake beyond o- that, Jake Ottinger. Yeah, Jake Ottinger. Yeah. And uh, I think I would have to say so because here's the thing. So so Dallas is not amazing. Is Winnipeg, Chicago, Arizona, are they better? No, but yeah. you gotta remember those wild cards are not divi- they're they're conference based too, right? So that's the yeah. thing is, you know, so you have to also ta- factor in San Jose, True. they're a mess. Anaheim is young. They maybe because remember they were a good first half team. We kind of figured that the, you know the yeah. the shoes would drop and they did. Um, but also remember they've got now John Klingberg on their back end for Anaheim. They've got some other pieces they moved around, so they may be a surprise. Although I don't expect them to be. Um, who else am I missing? Vancouver. You can't forget about Vancouver. They could be buying yeah, the next okay. wild card spot um, with Bruce Boudreau. I think uh, they definitely feel like they ended the season strong, which they did. Um, and also Vegas. How does Vegas respond under Bruce Cassidy um, yeah. with that? So I think the second wild card spot, I would say it's between Dallas, uh, Vancouver, and Vegas um, as far as, you know, for, for wild card number two. But And um, Seattle, who's going to win a cup this year, obviously. Right? Obviously. So I mean, especially with on. those under the table deals they did in their expansion draft. Uh, <laughs> so, but, you know, yeah. I, I think there, I think there is a little bit of play for the second wild card spot. But uh, again, you know, in both sides, right, you have uh, especially the central uh, Winnipeg, Arizona and uh, Chicago um, all looking to. Uh, yeah they're going to be in tough situations. And dare I say, how about Chicago? If they do indeed do some things that are certainly trending the way you talk about trades, I mean, Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves. And I will say this, Noah, if one goes, I think the other one goes too. Yeah. should be pretty interesting. It's either all, I think it's two or none. Yeah. should be pretty interesting. Uh, For those who are curious, by the way, the Minnesota wild, like we mentioned three o'clock today at home against Colorado for exhibition games. Uh, 8 p.m. Central Time in Colorado on uh, Tuesday, the 27th, then Thursday, the 29th. They are in Dallas at 7 o'clock. Um, then after that, the exhibition game in Milwaukee on the 2nd, which is a Sunday. Um, that's at 6.30 Central Time in Milwaukee against uh, Chicago. And then the final exhibition game is in St. Louis at 7 o'clock that Tuesday. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Um, two more after that. And then Thursday and Saturday is Chicago and Dallas at home at 7 and 5 p.m. Central Time better part of a week and then home opener season opener seven o'clock central time on the 13th. That's a Thursday against the New York Rangers, actually a four game homestand to open up the season for the Minnesota wild, as far as the regular season is concerned. So very excited uh, for that and all things Minnesota wild will be covering it as always, but I think it's high time. We head on to our extra ice session and wrap up what should be the start of the St. Louis state men's hockey season. Welcome into the Extra Ice Session, episode 130 here. Nick Maxson joining myself, Noah Grant. Nick, uh, St. Cloud State Hockey is getting ready for their matchup against St. Thomas on the 1st and 2nd of October this upcoming weekend. Uh, depth chart-wise, we've been talking a little bit about what we expect from this team here, Nick. Uh, do we want to do this the same way that we did it for the Minnesota Wild, where I, I, I say my picks and then you tell me how wrong I am? Sure. Okay. Um, forwards again? Yeah. Okay, sounds like a plan. Uh, top line, uh, Vieti Mietin on the left, Yami Kranila in the middle, Zach Okabe on the right. Um, actually, was the better, uh, was their best line consistently all last year? I don't know yep. how you break that up, honestly. Yep. That was that was the unit that uh, was together against Quinnipiac. Um, Micah Miller and Kyler Kuka were also together on the wings. They were uh, matched up, I believe, with Kevin Fitzgerald in the middle. They I were, re- yeah. I replaced Kevin Fitzgerald with Grant Crookshank um, on that like second that. unit. Um, mm-hmm. So that's my top six. Bottom six, again, getting challenging here, Nick. Um, Adam Ingram in the middle of Mason Salquist on the left and Joey Molinar on the right. And then fourth line, Chase Brand on the left, Ryan Roseborough on the right, 
Aiden Spellacy in the middle, and Ethan Acoin and Jack Rogers as the healthy scratches to start the season. Mm. Yeah, I figured you'd be, you'd be, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think Ethan Acoin will be a scratch based on my conversations with Brett Larson. Okay. So you're thinking Ethan Acoin instead of Ryan Rosborough? I'm thinking, yeah. Okay. I, I do think so. Now, mind jo- you, Joey Molinar was in that spot where I mentioned Ryan Rosborough last season. I, I, mm-hmm. I like Molinar's game. And I think he's someone that when Mason Solquist in a bulldog mentality and Adam Ingram in his skill, I think it allows Ingram to play a free flowing center style and have the support of a hard F1 on either side that's going to support him. Um, and then someone who's going to be defensively 200 foot responsible with him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think all four, all these guys in the bottom end, Chase Brand would be another guy that would look good as well too i think aiden spell he's got to send your fourth line though i mean he just you know, that's yeah at was, least to start you know? um it, it was a tough year for him last year and uh you kind of wonder how long the leash will be for aiden spell um uh, because towards the end of the year he was and there's he falling out of favor but and the, and there's where of course he's wearing uh, an assistant captain letter this year there's where ryan rosborough could slot too he could get his chance right. as a fourth line sentiment as well too so feeling Aiden Spellacy and Ryan Rosborough in some capacity and Ethan Acoin next to Chase Brand on that fourth line. Is that what we're going with? Yeah. Yeah. How do we feel about Mason Solquist, Adam Ingram, Joey Molinar? Because that's that's the line that has the most intrigue to me as far as, you know. Yeah, there's, there's intrigue there because with Solquist, I mean, like you said, he, he's he got a little bit of that greasy you know, side to him. Um, I thought he played pretty well down the stretch. Um, the one thing is, uh, I know they want more production from him. So I'm wondering, like you mentioned, move him to the wing. Maybe that frees him up a little bit. Um, yeah. but I also think too, at a a freshman going into a third line center role, you kind of wonder would they start him at center or would they start him at wing too? I think, I think yeah. if anything, you maybe switch Stolquist back in the center role of Ingram just to let him get a taste of NCAA hockey. And then maybe if he does progress nicely, you move him to center to give him a shot. The, the other option, for some reason I missed him. I was like, I know there's 15 forwards and I have 14 here. Grant Sean is another great option that you could yeah. also be throwing in here too on the fourth line, I think as well. Um, I forgot to mention him. Um, and he's a player, again, we talked about 5'10", 160. He's a guy that I just, I look at him and I I wonder the physical development. I think of the physical mm-hmm. development is there. The production is there. He's a guy that I would probably have in that scratch list as well, too, at least to start, but someone where it's like a fourth Sol- line. Yeah. If Mason Solquist, Chase Brand, Joey Molinar, um, Spellacy, Rosborough, a coin, if any of them struggle, I think he's the first guy in maybe um, Jack so, Rogers yeah. is, is a little bit of a, too much of an unknown for me at this point. Um, but again, you know, your conversations with Brett Larson too, again, it'd be nice to be able to see these guys at practice and make a more educated guess, but unfortunately we're not in that position, um, mm-hmm. at least right now. But um, yeah, I, again, I think more serviceability too. really this St. Cloud group compared to when we talked about the Minnesota wild has a little bit more separation, I think between their top nine and bottom three, a little bit, or at least mm-hmm. top six, um, you know, your top end guys, Grant Kirkshank, Micah Miller, Kyler Kupka, Okabe, Karen Lamiette, and they've been there. They've done that. Um, you know, and I think that there's a little bit more of a distinct separation between top and bottom. And that's probably partly the reason why the NCHC polls have them at fourth is simply mm-hmm. because of the fact that, you know, there is a little bit of that separation right now, just a little bit more unknown. Right. Um, so, yeah. Any other comments on the forwards here? Is there anything that you're kind of finding I, I, a way I to? Think, well, I just think you're going to see a lot of interchanging uh, throughout the early parts yeah, of the season uh, just to try to see you know, and, and try to figure out who is ready, who's not. Um, so I do think it's not going to be as set in stone as we've had maybe in years past just because there's such an influx of newer uh, players. But uh, I know Brett Larson, uh, he'll figure it out. And essentially, I should say that the players will figure it out for themselves. Yeah, certainly. And again, Grant Deshaun too, like I mentioned, you know, a guy that's very serviceable can play all roles too. So I think that bottom six, you're going to see kind of a smorgasbord. There's going to yep. be a lot of tweaking and retooling, I think, to see, to find the right combination Really, it's not so much about finding a third line checking forward, which I think is the most vital line in hockey is the third mm-hmm. line that really makes or breaks your identity of how you're going to have a top nine that's speed and skill, or you're going to have a third line that has its own distinction as a healthy mix, or if you're really going with a heavy, hard set of checking lines. But that fourth line, they've got to figure it out. They've got to find that yes, defensive shutdown line that can give you an energized, um, hard, heavy 45 seconds and, you know, maybe have limited minutes or be defensive only specialists. You've got to find that unit that they were yes, missing. Yes, you do from two years ago defensemen you've got nine defensemen here this is where i added the extra player because of course in college uh you do get that extra player and i think you got to dress seven defensemen here at least to start to. Uh, yeah to really evaluate something this was hard this was really difficult um i uh, i have a uh, top unit here uh josh lidke with dylan yep. anhorn Ooh. because uh, okay and, 
So Dylan Anhorn, the other person I was thinking is Brendan Bushy, who I have as a healthy scratch right now. And that was hard too. And we'll get to the, why that was too. Um, the, Again, these guys could really be interchangeable. My thought is you don't bring a guy in like Dylan Anhorn if you think he's going to sit on the bench all night. Not to say that mm -hmm. it doesn't breed competition. I just think he's going to get a look at least early. Um, yep. You know, it wasn't the biggest point producer, but I think he gets a look. I could see Brendan Bushy there as well, too, um, very easily mm -hmm. because of the defensive structure he plays. Josh Litke is uh, is kind of a stallion that's going to be running gun a little bit here this year in terms of letting him kind of free flow. Uh, obviously, you know, when looking at interviews, especially with Brett uh, and CHC Media Day, very high on him, very high on the season yes. that Josh had, as we have been in our show, too. I mean, he's primarily ready to maybe be the guy this year. Um, we'll have to see. Second unit, uh, Spencer Meyer, Jack Peer. Now, Spencer was with, uh, I believe, Brendan Bushy for a fair amount last season. He was, yeah. And Jack and Josh were together. I kind of like a little bit of mix here where maybe Spencer Meyer is the stay-at-home defenseman that lets Jack maybe kind of open up his game a little bit um, mm -hmm. as well, too. So that's kind of what I'm thinking is I'm thinking a younger guy who is still trying to find that extra footing, that extra gear to be successful in the NCHC. You let him run with a good stay at home defenseman. That's going to help you out on the back end. I think Spencer Meyer is going to be able to read and react with Jack a little bit appropriately. Cause there, if you're saying cloud, you, you want to unlock his potential this year. You know, he mm -hmm. had a good first season. I thought waiting for, you know, that fifth gear to become sixth gear for him and really kind of send that car down the road. Third pairing. Uh, this is where it got really difficult. Nick, I have Andre Trayball with Cooper Wiley right now. I like Cooper Wiley's production and uh, Mason Reiners, I think as a seventh defenseman, because I want to see how both of those guys perform at least to start. I could see Brendan Bushy where Cooper Wiley is. I could see Brendan Bushy where Dylan Anhorn is. I could see Brendan Bushy where Jack Peart is and move Jack up where Dylan Anhorn is. I think this defensive core is going to be an absolute free for all carrying nine defensemen. Brady Zemer is the other scratch, by the way, that um, right now for me, but I have mm -hmm. Brendan Bushy as a scratch, but geez, I could see him in the lineup every night as well, too. You know, that's no slight against him. Depends no. on how Cooper Wiley and Mason Reiners have looked in camp, have looked in exhibition games. If they get a chance to play, this is hard. It's hard. And that shows you there's a good thing. That's they've got yeah. a lot of good defensemen, right? Um, a couple of changes I want to make for you. I want to put Spencer Meyer with Josh Lidke and Ann okay. Horn with uh, Jack Peart. Jack. Yeah. I think uh, for Lidke, especially because uh, in, in granted, uh, I think you were talking about my conversation with Brett. We're at yep. CHC media day. Um, he, there's no question. Lidke is at least half of your top pairing defenseman based on the conversations I had. Uh, the yep. question is going to be, who is he going to be paired with? Right. I think Spencer Meyer will get a look at least initially um, just, uh, yep. Other other thing to pay attention, by the way, Josh Litke, a right-handed shot, as is Spencer Meyer. Mm -hmm. Brendan Brushy is a lefty. Dylan Anhorn's a lefty. And mm -hmm. Jack Peart is a lefty as well. Yep. So I think they're going to stay away from Peart and Litke, uh, Litke. I think that'd be... I know they tried that a little bit towards the end last year, and I think it was okay. I don't think it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, so I, I do agree with splitting those two, at least to start. Um, and, and maybe it just balances those top two to pairings out. I think that's what you're going for. Yeah. Um, and as you mentioned... Um, I think it's going to be a, a combination of Cooper Wiley, uh, Brennan Bushy, and Mason Ramers. I actually think that it's going to be Andre Trayball as the rotating yeah. scratch so, in and out. So I thought that, but here's the thing production wise and Andre Trayball, his liability is a little bit defensively. And that's kind of why he's been yes. minutes. He had 11 points last year. Brendan Bushy had a two, I think. Yeah. You know, one, like, one goal. And I think that was his first career goal, if I recall. Yeah. And that's what I'm um, saying. Trayball brings that production from the back end. So it's like, what do you want your identity to be? Do you want it to be where you are an offensive heavy team? Or do you want it defensively? I think you leave Andre Trayball in this roster, carry a seventh defenseman, and adjust accordingly. If you're looking for a little bit of offensive punch, he's in. If you're looking for a shutdown defensive pairing in the third period when you're clinging on to a one-goal lead, then maybe Brandon Bushy or Dylan Anhorn gets the call, right? You know. So and this is where I, I haven't tweeted this out just yet. So uh, Brett Larson's number one priority with his defensive core, he wants quick transition he wants the puck out of a zone as fast as he possibly can you yeah. felt like they spent a way too much time in their zone last year which they did at times he also yeah. felt like there were times where there were avenues to get the puck out and they didn't convert on those um and so you know that goes into where maybe the foot speed and maybe the hockey iq comes into play and that's where again like a guy like treble um can be that guy but again he can be sort of liable defensively yeah. um let's not lie on that um but again the good problem is 
you've got some different guys to go in to give your defensive core a bit of a different yeah. look, no matter which night, right? And so that, you were, yeah, and that's where it's like if you have Trey Ball with Brendan Bushy and Cooper Wiley or Mason Reiners is the seventh defenseman too. You know, that's the thing. Or Dylan Anhorn's down there. I think Josh Lidke, Spencer Meyer, Jack Pierre are, the, are your only safe bats in this lineup right now. I agree. Uh, yep. Anhorn, Trey Ball, Wiley, Reiners, Bushy, Zemer, all of them. You know, Brady Zemer, the biggest thing with him, we haven't talked about him quite a bit. The big thing for him that really kind of put him in the doghouse, so to speak, last year was his penalty trouble. Just inopportune mm -hmm. penalties at the right time and positional play. So, um, but again, you know, he could have grown this year too in, in terms of coming in, you know, in camp and vying for that spot too. So, well, and let's talk about Brady Zemer a little bit just because I think we all see if, because he plays a physical style and yep. I, I love a physical defenseman. I really do. But again, sometimes it was, he was committed to doing something physical when clearly it wasn't the right time or place to do that. Yeah. Um, I know that he, you know, he loves to be, you know, be sort of that, you know, baller, especially in front of the net. Um, again, very physical defenseman, but I think with Brett Larson, you have to be able to, especially with the puck, when you're, when you're turning the puck over and trying to move the puck North. Um, I think that's where another part of the game that he struggled at was uh, making that smart, either that first pass or maybe using your feet, you know, trying to move that puck North, but with possession, right. Making those smart plays. Um, I think again, a new season, we'll see where he goes, but Hey, you want big physic you want a big physical presence. You can put Bushy and Zemer in the lineup. You can leave, say, Reiners and Trey Ball out. Or if you want more speed and puck moving guys, you flip the other yeah. two, right? You I, have options. I love the balance. Yeah, exactly. I love the balance, you know, and yeah. the serviceability of these guys in terms of being utilitarian, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the thing. Adam Ingram, I think, you know, we feel good about, but that's the thing. Adam Ingram, Ryan Roseboro, Ethan Acoin, Jack Rogers, Dylan Anhorn, Cooper Wiley, Mason Reiners, you know, all of these guys that you look at. At, you know, even Grant Crookshank to an extent, you know, we have no idea you get, got, you know, and that's the thing is, you know, for us a couple of years ago, we could at least, you know, at least see parts of practice or maybe kind of get a look or that sort of thing. We're going to get our good look, obviously in the exhibition games next week. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, this could all be turned on its head too, as far as the matchups as well. So, um, yep. you know, th this is a really difficult thing. Again, not to slight anybody. I think all these guys definitely have a chance to play and play consistently this season. We talked about how high we were, especially last year on Mason Salquist, And of course had some injury bug, what was in on the lineup too. So you wonder how he's going to grow in the off season. You know, there's mm -hmm. so many unknowns, Nick forwards were kind of hard. Defense were really hard. You thought that was difficult. How about goaltenders, man? Yeah. Uh, Seriously, I have Dominic Bassi backed up by Jackson Caster. James Gray is a scratch, at least to start. Man, all mm -hmm. three of these guys, I think, can get a game this year easily. Like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and I think, I think at least in the exhibition games, you'll see a mix of all three. Yep. Um, I do think so. Yep. Um, he's done that in the past, so it should be no surprise. Uh, but again, James Gray and, and Brett Larson said it himself. Um, he's pushing the other two. Yeah. It, it's, it's not. Uh, a safe bet for the other two. And we talked about how that was good when it was Lamaru, Caster, and Rennick, right? There were there was a good, healthy competition for that spot. No, granted, I think the only one difference is I think, you know, Rennick was the favored person to be that guy. But yep. this year it's different. You don't have David Rennick. So I do think you're going to see maybe a bit of a rotation to start between yep. Caster as well as Bassey. And then if someone does end up winning that job, uh, maybe he sticks with it and finds a consistent name. Or maybe does he say, well, you know what? Last year, we kind of put ourselves in a bit of a pigeonhole yeah. um, and, you know, unintentionally, of course. Um, yeah. Do we want to continue to give um, somebody um, a bit of a, a couple looks here and there so that way, you know, God forbid, we do have an injury yeah. to a goaltender that we're not putting that goaltender in in a spot that is not really deemed to be successful. So yeah. you kind or, of wonder. Or do you run with that tandem? Some teams have had success in the past with a Friday, Saturday, you know, different tender, right. uh, tender, tender, <laughs> the old tenders, the old chicken tenders in that, right? Right. Um, yes. Yeah. Or for those who are playing the NHL game, the tenders, as far as players that get called up um, from high school levels. But nonetheless, yes. you know, all three of these guys have a chance to be called up to be the guy between the pipes, I think, you know, and like I said, I'm really high on James Gray, his production, um, you know, or lack of, I should say. I, uh, I just wonder how quick the adjustment is. And you've got two very capable goaltenders in front of him. Jackson Castor, he's seen time, you know, he's seen time mm -hmm. in the net, uh, you know, take away the Quinnipiac, whatever you want to call it. You know, he's had some really good yeah. success and he's been a very serviceable goaltender to this point. He's going to push Dominic and the way that he's coming over from Colorado college for that starting spot too. I, I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, very exciting. Uh, I think if you're a Huskies fan, because there's a lot of intrigue with this team. I think last year, you know, you had the, the national championship hangover, you had the bounces mm -hmm. that didn't go your way. You know, a lot of it was 
a known commodity in some respects. And then you have that expectation, which is a good thing, but you also have, have this pre-constructed framework of how you think the team should be or it's going to go. All bets are off this year. I think that's kind of fun. I do too. And, And we've dare we say that when this Huskies team, you know, historically has had not this sort of expectation. That's when they go on these runs. Yeah. Um, there's and again, there's a lot of room for the op- the offensive players, especially. Um, there's a lot of great talent that's coming in that's replacing some great talent that left. Um, again, I, I think you've got depth and intrigue at every single position. And you yeah. know, again, that's all good things. I mean, I know that. Huskies fans, we're all dying for a national championship. We're all dying to get back to our Frozen Four, which, mind you, this year it's down in Tampa, if I recall, right? Or is Amelie it? Arena, yeah, yeah, it's in MLA. So, um, wouldn't that be a nice little uh, April trip down to uh, the good old city by the uh, by the bay? That would be pretty nice. Um, yeah. So, um, I think I think there's potential there. Now, granted, Nick, Nick's been to Emily Arena, so he wants just, to go again. I know, I do actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at the end of the day, right? Uh, it's going to be a tough. I mean, and granted, the one that's good about not only what the roster is, but also in the conference, they're going through a gauntlet of a schedule, non-conference yeah. and conference. Again, we we talk about preparing this team uh, to play, uh, you know, in the playoffs. They will be. Uh, question is, can they execute it right? So um, I think it's going to be an exciting season again. Uh, the NCHC is going to be so tough this year again with possibly six teams deep buying for yeah. the top four spots. Um, but I think this team can do it. Um, they're just going to have to, you know, adjust, uh, you know, especially some of the newer players coming in, find that right mix uh, front and back of the lineup and go from yeah. there. And score more goals than the other team, right? Uh, oh, I forgot about that part. It helps. Uh, Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, for those very quickly to run through, St. Thomas is in – it's St. Paul on Saturday and then St. Cloud yeah. on Sunday. Um, Wisconsin, Mankato, Bemidji State, Denver, Western, Colorado College, North Dakota, Miami for the first half schedule. December 30th, exhibition game against Manitoba. Um, North Dakota has them to open the season, so keep an eye on that one. And then uh, starting in January, um, versus and at Minnesota for that home and home. And then Colorado College, Denver, Duluth, Miami, North Dakota, Omaha, and Duluth to finish the season. Also, by the way, those games, October 28th and 29th, um, first in Bemidji at the Sanford Center, and then at home that Saturday. That's another home and home as well, too. So, um, yeah, excited uh, to cover some St. Cloud State Huskies hockey. Nick and I, of course, will be collaborating uh, the weekend of the Mankato series. We'll be calling some games together Mm -hmm. and then also covering those Cato games. So we're going to see a lot of hockey hockey uh during that weekend obviously but yeah nick uh again different recording time coming up next week for our fans and our listeners so keep an eye on that one probably a tuesday or wednesday morning release at the latest um and we're going to recap our first weekends of men's and women's college hockey for st Cloud state it's already that time again yeah excited and of course some minnesota wild getting ready for the end of their preseason uh and start of the regular season as well for nick max and i'm noah grant and we will see you soon in the den Timer come in, they score! Ripped in! A bomb from Perrix! So Dana Rasmussen fires and she scores! Dana Rasmussen for the Huskies alongside. Dwayne Kaprizov in for a chance to win it! He scores! is now 42.6 seconds away from wrapping up the school's first ever title.